there will be no real non-controlled currency in the world. We're coming for you, banks. Increasing the block size to 32 megabytes right now. What would be the top five arguments that would get um, hurled against me? No, that's a good one. There, there are a few that the big blockers uh, uh, got, got right. Ching, like all these coins splash into the wallets of all the winners. I love that. There's a new threat out there. It's crypto. Hello and welcome back to the Bitcoin Cash podcast. Following Bitcoin Cash on its rise to global reserve currency. This is episode number 119, Narrative Collapse Clip Compilation. Today is Sunday, the 30th of June, 2024. I'm your host, Jeremy. Jet is doing the producing, same as always. And today, we are not having a guest. We haven't done a no guest episode in a while, but I feel like it was kind of justified. We've got a ton of clips and we're going to just do a complete breakdown of the absolute cataclysmic disaster that BTC is turning into for everyone who needs a bit of that. We were right the whole time. <laughs> Vindication feeling. <laughs> we will be bringing that in spades uh, this episode. But I do want to say before we get into all that, that Obviously, I uh, we need to be setting the bar higher than them, right? That's uh, I really like this saying that it's not a problem unless you've got a solution. And I think that's an attitude the BCH community has to have. In general, obviously, if we're there pointing out, okay, you guys are wrong and you're screwing up this and you're failing at that and pointing fun and laughing and so forth, that's that's great. But really, number one, we should be setting the bar higher. And then number two, we can obviously point fingers and jeer and laugh <laughs> because sometimes it feels good and there's been plenty of mockery the other way. So if they deserve it, they deserve it. But first, uh, first of all, we got to get our own house in order before we point at anybody else. So I will be making some uh, notes about that before we get into all the drama uh, in the second half. Jet, how are you doing today, man? I'm doing all right. Feeling a little bit, uh, I guess, uh, foggy. Uh, life's been real hectic over the past couple of weeks, but I'm doing good. You've been following any of the drama about the U.S. elections? Oh, I did um, last night. No, night before last, I think it was. Watch the debate and... Uh, Brilliant. That was fun. <laughs> okay, good, good. Well, that's going to come in handy. Uh, so that's that's also sort of relevant uh, context. We will touch on why that's important uh, in a minute. And I know some people follow that more closely and some some don't, you know, so we'll do our best to fill in the sort of <laughs> details there. But uh, we're certainly at an interesting point <laughs> in history. Hello to Bitcoin Cash Brazil, which might be Bruno or might be someone else. But uh, first one in the chat there. Good to see you whether it's Bruno or not. Okay, quick self shill is we've got our new flip starter is up for episodes 116 to 125. It's already two thirds completed. 21 out of 29.85 BCH has been raised. So please pitch in and get us the rest of the way there if you're enjoying the show and loving it. We got sick of messing around with the DNS subdomain, which is an absolute nightmare. So you can find that at bchpodcastflipstarter.cash. It's got its own separate domain name now. Or if you go on bitcoincashpodcast.com, there's a link um, right there. So uh, as always, we've I think this is now our fifth one, but we've delivered the previous four, I feel, to a pretty good standard. And this is our... Uh, fifth one because we got to keep <laughs> we got to keep the show <laughs> running. That's what this is all about. As Bruno uh, would say, you know, you can't be shilling capitalism and be broke. So that's what we <laughs> we're here trying to demonstrate. You should be able to make a, a few sats for yourself. Okay, checking in on the price. 
this week bitcoin cash is down only usd 386 dollars and 75 cents buys you 100 megasats so that's way down one btc sat buys 159.6 bch sats which is also down and one ethereum buys 882 megasats which is also down so not a great week for bch unless you were sitting in some nice bch bull hedges which i'm sure at least some of our listeners were but i was not so uh, RIP to me. How are you feeling? Oh, here we go. Jet's showing off his Be The Bull NFC backup card that he got at Bliss, right? Walk us through that, mate. I got a white one too. <laughs> yeah, well, no need to show off, mate. Well, I want to show it off. Let's, look, if you weren't at Bliss, this is what you missed out on. Next time, come on down. Um, to be honest, I haven't even gotten a chance to use it because I uh, don't use Chrome uh, and I mostly use uh, BCH Bull on mobile. So I'm waiting for the like export feature to come to the PWA. And I'm curious if like I don't know enough about PWA uh, to know if it uses my default system browser or whatnot. But yeah, that's what I'm waiting for. Uh, well, this is very on theme, though, because uh, this is something that I feel I always see people complain, like we've talked before about people say, oh, my uh, grandma is not going to be able to get into BCA. She's going to lose her keys, blah, 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 blah. But I feel like this kind of thing is more the direction that things will go in. It will get to the point of like, you have your phone. It comes with two little plastic credit card type things that you swipe to just like NFC style tap to pay type thing that backs up your keys. You've just got to put those two cards somewhere safe and then boom, you're done. And like people can just put it in their jewelry drawer or whatever. And in the vast majority of cases, that's going to be fine. Obviously it's not the world's most highest institutional grade security, but it will work for everyone's like casual spending and more serious amounts of money will require more serious effort, but that's just how money works. So that's nothing different, right? Yeah. And I mean, I really like the card format too. Like when it comes to the uh, hardware wallets and stuff, like I love that the Satoshi hardware wallet is the same, just card. Uh, it's a Java card, so it's not quite as simple, but yeah, there's something to be said about the form factor because even like single board computers go for that credit card size and shape, right? Yeah, well, then you can carry it in your wallet if you need to, which probably shouldn't be doing with your BCH backup codes, but all kinds of things, then little card holders or other things that are built with that kind of size in mind, little like storage boxes and stuff like that. Uh, you could use your Magic the Gathering <laughs> deck boxes and just <laughs> sneak it in there next to your Black Lotuses, you know, <laughs> a fifth of gaming. Oh, I uh, would know all about that. So, you know. <laughs> Quick tangent. Have you played Bellatro? No, what's that? Oh, oh, I'm late to the party, but uh, it's just like this. It's a Steam game. You... The whole thing is you got to get these points. You get points by playing poker hands, but then you have like Joker cards, tarot cards, specter cards, celestial cards. And each of those things do like, uh, they either add chips or add multipliers or give you, it just like makes the game a little more fluid. It's unfortunately not multiplayer because I'm looking for a game that I'm like really into to start a guild for, but uh, it's a good time. I do recommend it. I've sunk like probably 12 hours into it over the past week, which is wild. I think, for me. They, but they are going to add multiplayer, right? If it's popular and it's growing, surely that would be in demand, right? It's hard, like, because uh, you're not playing against bots or anything. It's just like uh, you have this threshold score that you're trying to get to for each round. So it would. it's not really made for multiplayer. They'd have to come up with some new mechanic to it format yeah. yeah but it'd be a good time that's cool yeah, though. for sure yeah yeah all those kind of poker variations and stuff i'm certainly no poker pro i've played it a bit and i'm probably good enough to not be the crappiest person in an average room i would be the crappiest person in an average 
room of poker players, but uh, you know, non poker players, I'm probably not going to be the first one, <laughs> first one out. But I do know that there's, of course, there's always people trying to innovate on poker and do those alternative formats. And what's that other one called? You know, there's like stud poker, and I'm trying to remember what's that other other one called that's kind of popular. It's not Texas Hold'em. You know, there's all the different variations. I'm not surprised to hear people making sort of mixed versions of of that because poker's got a lot going for it but yeah it can get a bit stale if you're not like hardcore on the main sort of stuff and you just want to have some fun it does yeah. get a bit dry i find and this one's gonna be a good one yeah it, it's kind of built like a like a it's got so many like casino style animations and like flashy pop-ups it's made to like oh, your just dopamine be, yeah yeah, yeah. I, yeah, okay. As long as you're aware of that, it's a good. That's time. no defense, mate. I realized I walked past this ad a couple of times for chicken nuggets, and then when I was hungry this morning, I just went and got the chicken nuggets. And then afterwards, I was walking along thinking, "Damn, they got me, man. They totally got me." Usually, I wouldn't get the chicken nuggets, but I did this time. It was in my subconscious. We really don't realize how we're all being programmed all the time, you know. But were they yeah. good nuggets? Yes. That's what can. But now I'm like, were they actually good or was I just expecting them to be good because I'd been seeing signs saying these are really good? Like <laughs> enough times. I think I think they were good, but maybe I'm just fooling myself. It's uh, a cipher with the steak, you know. The steak, the matrix is telling me mind that this is juicy and delicious after all these years. Ignorance is bliss. That's what I realize. Yeah. Great, uh, great movie. Okay. All right. So I said before we get into all the roasting of everybody, we've got to set the bar higher ourselves. So let me let me start off on that track. Celine Wallet will be dropping an update probably this week. We we're planning to get it out, but Callisti's been a bit under the weather. So I think it's going to come out this week the June uh, 2024 release. So if you go on your Celine wallet and you go on the settings page at the bottom, it has the uh, version number there. So everyone will have 2024.05.0, but we'll have 2024.06.0 being released this week. That is going to include the highly requested bio and pin auth features. Loads of people were just asking for that i personally am not you know in grand need of that i feel like but so many people said look can i lock my wallet and only have it unlock with like face id and with a pin to stop uh, my funds being sent out if i'm not you know if i happen to leave my phone open or something like that so that will also be coming plus bug fixes and performance improvements. And I have been back in front of the code editor as well to myself. It's been a little while, but I've been pumping out some code and I have added the long promised daily user tracking so that you'll be able to see how many people are actively using Celine. That is only gonna be in the pre-release mode. It will not be in the sort of main app uh, to start with once we get that June release out. So in the July release, we'll probably put it out as a mainline feature. But if you want to try it in the June release, once you have it, you can go on that credits page and tap the Celine icon six times uh, in quick succession. And then it pops you into this special little menu uh, where you can enable experimental features and soon pre-release features and you can go in there and turn on pre-release features and then you can try out this user tracking ahead of time if you want to do that obviously a word of caution if you're trying the experimental or the pre-release features definitely make sure you've done your backups first i don't you know there's not likely to be catastrophic bugs but there's a reason they're the pre-release features (laughs) which is that there's a higher chance than normal so if you're getting involved in any of that Uh, feel free to it's actually going to be pretty cool because our plan is you know we'll be rolling out uh things sort of in month by month so people can always get uh, some of the latest stuff we're working on uh, ahead of time or test it out if they want to but yeah you should only do that obviously if you feel pretty confident with celine wallet generally and uh you've backed up your coins and stuff like that because by definition we'll be we'll be doing stuff that's a bit experimental in there 
Now, in July, uh, the focus is going to be on cash tokens and coin control. So probably by the end of July or start of August, uh, June, July, August, yeah, start of August um, release, we're hoping to have cash tokens support or at least the beginnings of that and also coin control so you can see what UTXOs you have and different assets and stuff like that. So everybody who's been wanting and requesting that know that that's coming down the pipeline. And also in unrelated but semi-related news, this week General Protocols has confirmed that work will be beginning uh, their uh, software development with native wallet solutions. So they haven't said specifically yet whether they're going to build their own wallet to do this stuff or whether they're going to maybe integrate it with Celine or with Cash and Eyes or any other option, but they promised they would look at all the available wallets and see how to best fit into that landscape. Because ideally, if they develop some really powerful stuff for things like Flipstarter, or like any hedge uh, cash tokens, contracts, and so forth, if that just plugs straight into everyone's uh, wallets really easily, or it's designed to do that, or for other teams to be able to adopt it easily, that would be absolutely sick, and it would help BCH just accelerate to the next level. And I really feel like the ecosystem is getting to a point where, like for Celine, we've spent the whole last year and a bit working you know mostly on basic send and receive translating into different languages localization setting your electrum server like basic stuff like that multiple wallets fixing bugs in the transactions and so on but we're now starting to get to the fun part where we start adding cool features that can actually make crypto stand out more than just hey look let me send you some bch which is cool on its own but it's not going to get us global reserve currency so I feel like, yeah, we're getting to that stage. And then the stage after that is going to be all these native wallet integrations, which will really put us at the forefront of the entire industry. So that's one example of BCH setting the bar higher. Any thoughts on any of that? I'm super pumped to uh, get some more mobile wallets that you can use cash tokens on. I don't like browser wallets. Like, and I, I mean... I like them when I have to use them. I'm glad they exist. I'm not saying don't work on browser wallets, but I prefer to have like a dedicated piece of software for the wallet. So having like another mobile wallet that you can access and send and receive cash tokens is going to be sick. Uh, and also the native wallet integrations. I'm We've been talking about this for a couple months now. It's nice to see there's the commitment like, okay, we're going to, People are, real people are actually putting the work in. It's not just a hope anymore. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm surprised, honestly, that it's coming about sort of as fast as it is. Like things must be rocketing along at BCH Bull, I feel like, for them to sort of say, okay, let's dedicate some of our research because this is a non-trivial project, right? This is a big undertaking and they're some of the ones best place to to do it but it's just like in my mind we sort of have a delivery pipeline across the community so you can think of like the protocol upgrades so right now you've got vm limits you've got utxo commitments are kind of like getting chambered up in that and before even ahead of that sort of in the future working backwards you might even have you know sub satoshis of quantum resistance or things that are vaguely being discussed then you have the things that are actually sort of being discussed vm limits utxo commitments then you have like abla that we already shipped and then cash tokens and then at the same time as that then you have like the wallets which are all starting to add you know the basic send and receive stuff is done really well cash and eyes um we've got cash token studio as well and the tooling is building up there Celine is starting to get into more advanced stuff. Paytaka and Zappet are working on their P2P marketplaces and cooler sort of bigger features as well like that. Hopefully we're gonna get onto maps and so forth, all that. And then we just have this next thing with native wallets already coming. It's like just one thing after another, the tech is really starting to get rolling even with a pretty small development kind of community and resources there innovation and rate of change is just massive and I can't even, I'm already struggling to keep up, you know? So I think that's, that's great news. We're really, really moving in the right direction there. You're going to have a lot of work I... on your plate then. Like you're struggling <laughs> to keep well, up. That. Like the average person's coming to you, Jeremy.
That's right. Exactly. Exactly. And I love doing it. I'm so glad it's you know going to be hopefully soon my sort of full time um, preoccupation. But that's that's really just the the best. And the thing is, yeah, then we just have to find a way to synthesize it down to just the most important stuff. But inevitably, it's going to get bigger than than even I could follow. Uh, like cryptocurrency as a whole is obviously way past that. But even BCH, that's that's such a a good. Um, Good state to be in. Okay, speaking of that, we've also got another big industry leading innovation uh, potentially in the chamber, ready to rock and roll by the end of this year, which is emergent coding. We've talked about this on the show a couple of times before. This is a project from the Bitcoin Cash City guys in Townsville who have all of their merchant adoption and work they're doing down there, but they also have a kind of little tech incubator, BCH hub, and uh, they have been working on a system that lets you use Bitcoin Cash payment channels. So imagine like the Lightning Network, except built by people who are actually quality engineers and with a functioning base layer that they can sort of spin up this uh, temporary lightning network, let's say, and then use that to coordinate a bunch of software automation to build new software tools, all sort of paid for in Bitcoin cash with a components market and all this kind of stuff. And that has been in the works for many, many years and sort of like a lot of things, it's been 18 months away TM uh, and it hasn't really come through on the promised uh, timelines, but the team down there are working really hard and I do believe they're gonna ship something absolutely incredible. It's just a question of getting it over the line. So this week, Fiendish Crypto was in the Telegram group and he asked Noel uh, from the Bitcoin Cash City about what the latest updates were because they had been doing quite a lot of uh, sort of beta testing and stuff and you can really see the on-chain transaction volumes. So um, BCH has once again been spiking up to close to BTC daily levels of on-chain activity, 400, 450,000, 500 transactions per day as a result of this, but then it had quieted down and Fiendish asked Noel what was going on. Are we going to get kind of a final release? And so here is the latest update from Noel. Quote, Fiendish Crypto, thanks for reaching out. Very shrewd observation. And the reason is that we have finalized the second released candidate in brackets G29 and have been preparing to boot it targeting the week of the 24th, June the 24th. It is sporting a second gen catalog based on our new Kademlia component suite. Some of that traffic is also testing our upcoming third release candidate, which is the candidate market geared for public release. And then he goes on at Fiendish Crypto and all the good folks of the One True Currency. As you know, we have experienced a lot of schedule pressure in bringing this huge project to market. The difficulty is not due to whether the tech is good or not, but due to its huge size, driven by our desire to secure the integrity that comes with using the tech to build the tech. This integrity has come at the cost of constructing slash testing slash deploying many thousands of components and managing such a huge portfolio. But here is fair warning to you and our fellow BCH brethren that blockchain traffic is payment channel open slash closes and while dominant, do not reflect this truly staggering amount of payments actually conducted. So here it is, strap in people, Bitcoin Cash is going on a bender in the second half of this year, the likes no crypto has seen, exclamation point, end quote. So it's, uh, you know, there's no hard uh, release date in there, but I am expecting that in this second half of the year, sort of by the end of 2024, we should be seeing some kind of public launch of emergent coding and we can really get to the bottom of it given that when it's rolling it can take bitcoin from or bc8 from twenty thousand transactions a day up to five hundred thousand transactions a day just in the early beta and all this for creating a, a you know building up a payment network that is then itself doing like millions and millions more transactions it'll be really insane if this this gets going on a on a daily basis, uh, what do you make of the chances of seeing this? Is this 18 months TM or are we, are we likely to see a payoff by the end of the year? We are in the second half of this year, right? So 
as of tomorrow. Yeah. I guess if he's saying like we're that close, I gotta I gotta take the I take it with a grain of salt, but I'll be like, okay, the confidence is there for me to have a little more belief. Um, I'm curious though, like if a lot of these, if a lot of this traffic is just open and closes in a channel, like is the is has the testing been automated testing, or are there real people already using it? And I believe they already have real sort of users uh, that are in their sort of private beta that are building like they they did do a long period where just it was them just internally sort of testing it and they had to first get all the payment channels and stuff to open and close correctly and then they had to do it with act, actual traffic flowing across it and then they had to do it with people who actually needed to use it to build their own stuff which is i believe what's happening now but only for like privately invited beta people. And then second half of this year, it goes out to the public. Maybe there'll be a public beta and then a full release or maybe just a full release. Yeah, it makes me really curious what happens then when we give an, an LLM access to like send and receive BCH and it's the, the ability to like write and uh, compose code. That's gonna be very interesting. Yeah, it's, it promises to be pretty wild if it all comes together. Of course, I'm, you know, reserved until I'll believe it when I see it uh, kind of thing. Although I have I have seen it, to be fair. I did uh, see it when I was in Townsville. I got a bit of a private demo of some of what they're working on. So I can confirm it's real. And I think that, you know, they're going to deliver on it. But again, it's just like, how long is a piece of string uh, when things are like, yeah, would you know, We'll deliver it soon. We'll deliver it soon. We'll deliver it soon. And I guess Noel is just setting the highest possible standards. I mean, I'm as an engineer, I'm a bit more slapdash. I'm a bit more like let's ship it, and the users will, you know, the users would rather have something than nothing. And once they've got it, if there's some bugs, we'll fix it. But uh, that's probably why it's good that I have Callisti managing the release cycle for some lead. Because if it was up to me, I just be like, let's go, let's go, <laughs> let's just uh, pump this out. So you need a bit of a healthy mix. Uh, on your team, I think. So anyway, that's that's all just to say that this is another area that Bitcoin Cash is potentially leading the industry and raising the bar to a level that nobody has really seen or is really aware of. I mean, even once it's going in BCH, it'll take a little while to catch on. But by the rest of the time, the rest of the industry figures this out. I um, mean, then will be another few steps in the future, right? So just to just to say that. Yeah, to any extent that we're criticizing anyone else, it's not because we're not um, putting up results and uh, work ourselves. Although, of course, yeah, this does remain to be seen. So caveat with that. Okay, community comment of the week. Yeah, it's nice and early this time. It's from Esteban, a rare passenger who's been on the show on episode 75 or 76, I think. And he said on Twitter, quote, did some work, got paid in crypto, long weekend with the missus, booked a hotel, paid in crypto, fee 904 sats, 0 0.003 uh, dollars, payment instant, confirmation one minute, this works for me. And the coining asked, what did you use? And Esteban replied, BCH. So it is really working. It's been great to see I remember being on some of the streams when he came on my show and even a bit before that and telling him about how BTC was hijacked and it was all a bit of a scam and BCH was the real Bitcoin and that was the one that was going to work. And it, he was looking at me like, what is this guy talking about? But of course, over time, he is a regular crypto user and he's a very open minded, honest guy. And he's come to see that th this is it. It's just BCH just works and BTC doesn't. And he started to see through all the propaganda and lies. So hats off to him. And it just really goes to show to me that he's a very legit guy and he's just living on crypto. And if we're serving him better than the competitors and he's giving us, you know, rave reviews like this, that we are doing something right. And obviously we can always do better. There's there's plenty you know, of work we have to do to make that easy enough that we can get those same reviews from people who aren't as deep in, in the rabbit hole and passionate and involved as him. But to me, that's just very, very vindicating, you know? Yeah, I'm curious if it uh, was BCH on both sides, like receiving BCH for the work and also paying 
uh, with BCH for the hotel. I believe so. Yeah. Cool. I would. I mean, the the text is only sort of makes it sound like that was the sending side, but yeah, yeah. I don't know. Because I'd be curious. Like, he must have got paid in the BCH at some point, basically. Right, but. I think it's even more damning if he was paid in BTC and then had to convert to BCH for the hotel payment. Well, that's true. Although, Maybe on the other it. hand, on the other hand, then then uh, then that shows we've got work to do that he can't convince the per- his client to then switch over to BCH. You know, that's fair. Um, so, hmm. all right, uh, but yeah, that's great stuff. So it's good to see that you know just keep putting up results day after day after day and and like uh like another thing i really like people another saying is people don't notice you're there people notice you're still there that's just exactly what's happening in that case okay we've got one excellent piece of news this week julian assange has been freed he signed a plea deal with the u.s government sentencing him effectively to time served which was already his five years in belmarsh or whatever it was and i guess technically not his previous time <laughs> locked in the ecuadorian embassy and <laughs> on the run and so forth but uh, i think that was sort of considered as part of his uh sentencing however he was not home scot-free in that he had to pay five hundred thousand dollars for a private flight from the UK to Saipan where he was getting sentenced and then back to Australia. So apparently he wasn't allowed to just take Ryanair, maybe spend his time in closed <laughs> quarters that he wasn't feeling like that. But yeah, anyway, he was mandated to take this flight and needed 500K. So that's a bit of another government grift right at the end there. Uh, he got an eight BTC donation, which would essentially pay for the whole thing. And then bizarrely, Andrew Tate sort of tried to claim credit for it without much proof. And a lot of the BTC community basically called him out and said, like, look, mate, if you'd actually done this, you would provide proof and try and showboat about it. You're just here trying to grift off it uh, for attention because Jack Dorsey also made some sort of vague comments around the time that the donation had been sent. So I would probably think it was more likely Jack, but either way, you know, he got the money for the flight, so that was good. And he also got 300K in fiat donations. So I guess he doesn't need to need to be hitting the bricks to work at McDonald's anytime soon, which is a good Good start. <laughs> uh, of course, you know, I wish him all the best. I'm very glad that he got out and it's a huge win for just the titanic amount of uh, activism that has been done around the world to try and advocate for his freedoms of stuff. Of course, it's a bit ridiculous that he still in the end was charged with the crime of journalism, essentially, than releasing true information on government uh malfeasance was yeah ended up being a reason to punish him so that's pretty ridiculous but at the end of the day he he got out so that's great it seems the price was also some further shenanigans where wikileaks has had to remove some of the incriminating dnc uh documentation so of course cynically he couldn't just get out because it was the just thing but uh no doubt had to cut some kind of deal there to try and cover up all the criminal, you know, bullshit that goes on uh, with them there. So, uh, I mean, a win's a win, but uh, as we can see, there's no such thing as, uh, uh, I guess, strings unattached government deal, really. What did you take away from this? Did it feel like a win, Jet? It felt like a win overall. Like the man's been rotting in like a, what, eight by eight room for too long why like even if it's like oh he's got to get a private flight because it's like no fly lists and maybe security clearance stuff like I, why is it half a million dollars like i assume the average private flight is not even close to half a million dollars because there's no fucking way that like you know rappers on the up and up are like oh yeah i'm just gonna like blow this on every stop of a tour like 
Well, do those guys actually do that though? Because the one thing I found out about is there is literally studios in Los Angeles that they, I think we might've even talked about it on the show where that they can go to and it's like the interior of a uh, fake private flight. So you can go there and take all these photos of you sitting in different poses and like wearing different clothes and like holding a martini glass or whatever. And then over the next six months on your Instagram, you can be like, oh, look, I was just bawling on this other flight, but really you were sitting in a shed in Los Angeles. Uh, and that's just this big grift that I didn't know about, but was unsurprised. I, I, I don't know if rappers are really going on private flights. I mean, it would also be different if you were just doing like private flights around the US and you booked a whole series of them, I'm sure you could get a group discount or whatever versus a one-time flight from the UK to Saipan to Australia. That's like around the entire globe, basically. That's a that's a pretty big flight. But So Paramount Business Jets says that the cost to rent a private jet varies from two grand to 14 grand per flight hour. But even still, like let's say you're flying for you know 24 hours uh that should well still like in grand quarter. to 24 hours yeah that's you know that's uh well 24 hours at 14 grand is 140 times 2 to like 280 that's that's getting up there you know close to that and then you got to bring along you know your groupies or whatever so that's <laughs> that's extra. <laughs> I mean, this is this is just all to say that obviously we'll be uh, getting private flights to Bliss uh, <laughs> in future. <laughs> BCH Argentina, you know, we're gonna uh, rock up. I think on the the private jet, maybe. Uh, I'll I'll see if we can find room in the budget. Maybe just uh, tack that on the flip starter. <laughs> Uh, but anyway welcome back to australia julian very glad that he has uh made it out and i hope he enjoys his life it'll be interesting to see if he sort of sticks his nose into it again do you think he's gonna lie low and just not uh you know stir the pot probably for a little while at least but on the other hand you've got to imagine like when somebody's that passionate i almost feel like now he's out he might be fired up to just like go back for round two uh, any, any thoughts? <laughs> yeah. So I know like you can't get tried for the same crime twice without new evidence, right? Double jeopardy and stuff. But does that apply across countries? Like, is he actually safe or is he still going to have to be concerned that, you know, 13 years down the road, he's going to get a knock on his door like, hey, we found this new piece of evidence. And uh, guess what, buddy? <laughs> Well, who knows what all the different, you know, what's involved in his different deals and things that he's signed. Like yeah. there might be some extraneous conditions there, but certainly he's not going to be in the position that even anything that could maybe slide by, like if it was somebody else, if it was him, it's going to, it's going to immediately turn into a huge like shitstorm. <laughs> so uh, we'll have to wait and see what he does. I mean, obviously that's up to him. I think He's a good guy to have fighting for government transparency. So I hope he continues in that capacity. But at the same time, he's done more than his share of uh, lifetime contribution. So if he wants to just sit it out and let somebody else get in the firing line, yeah, I have no qualms about that, that choice either, really, I'd say. Okay, we've got some other news here. Uh, we don't need to go into all the detail, but this is just a few other things because we haven't done the show in a couple of weeks, so we didn't cover uh, a lot of these different things. Apple Pay has launched a tap to pay between iPhones. It looks like it's got a pretty slick animation. I haven't seen anybody actually doing this uh, in reality, but this is kind of bad news in the sense that you know, crypto needed to be on this a decade ago, and we could have been if it weren't for the block size war and all the company, you know, palaver. But the the fiat payment rails are always getting better and better. Like crypto is still going to win in the end, just because it's not going to get inflated away to nothing. And these centralized things still can't compete against decentralized ecosystems over a long enough time frame. But uh, it really is making our life tougher. The fact that these guys are rolling out slick payments and stuff because crypto has just been too delayed. So I'm not um, really loving it there. Of course, anybody who 
is on that crypto just needs to be a store of value blah 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 is just oblivious to the fact that millions and millions of people are now just adopting solutions that make them ever less interested in crypto so that's a bit of a disaster true inflation have uh, said that us inflation is now at 25 percent, which is probably believable you've been seeing more and more people putting out stuff about oh my grocery bill has doubled in the last year or whatever um the case may be while meantime in argentina they've hit zero percent inflation for the first time in 20 years javier millet's chainsawing the state has <laughs> made it a big difference there so we can see you know us going in the wrong direction argentina maybe going in the right one donald trump has apparently been in talks to maybe appear at the btc conference in nashville in july that'll be really interesting i kind of hope he does and that he's uh there because it's good exposure for crypto as a whole uh but we're, i'm going to be fascinated to see what happens at the btc conference this year their ecosystem does seem to be dying a bit so this is the first you know year that they've been shrinking and they've moved to nashville instead of miami which I sort of think is maybe because the show is getting smaller and smaller uh, as much as they try and brand it as we're relocating because it's cool and fun. No, you're just not uh, justifying booking out Miami anymore, guys. So anyway, we'll wait and see if there's any uh, surprises coming out of that or whether it's going to be a shill fest of the same people saying the same stuff like it was the last couple of years with nothing really new to offer and finally we've got mount gox uh promising for the millionth time that they're about to do their payouts of up to 140,000 btc and bch do you have any thoughts on any of these uh... i feel like inflation's higher but maybe that's my canadian bias coming through I saw, oh, it wasn't, uh, didn't, uh, oh, what's his name? Jesse, the guy that runs Kraken. Uh, didn't yeah, he also? Yeah. A million, yeah. A million in there to yeah. Donald Trump. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like Trump is going to be like the crypto candidate. I mean, I know other candidates before have kind of promoted that they're interested or they're pro crypto or whatever, but it seems like he's got the push to really be like, yeah, we're going on. Kind of like you mentioned with uh, on the episode with Jaeger, right? Like, I still don't think we've crossed that line like you were talking about. Um, but it really seems like he's setting himself up to be that. And yeah, Mount Gox, I, I believe it when I see it. 18 more months. Yeah, one thing about people were asking about the Mount Gox thing. And this is, to be clear, this is absolute, complete, total speculation, right? But uh people were talking about okay well after the coins come out you know isn't everybody just going to dump their bch and it's going to fuck up our price ratio and stuff like that but uh, we really don't have to be worried about that right and there's two huge factors in the favor of bch in that regard in my opinion the first is that uh this is mount gox creditors so they've all been in it since at least before February 2014. And so those are all people that are on average, compared to the average person, much harder to you know scam about BCH. Like they know the history, they know how Bitcoin was in the early days, they know that it got diverted, whether they were on one side or the other and all that, you know. So they did get a chance to see. So relative to the average person, they're gonna be more BCH friendly than you would expect. And the second thing is also that there is the price ratio, which right now is at 160 to one, which essentially means that if one person converts, you know, one BTC worth of coins into BCH, then that cancels out 160 BCH being converted into BTC. So it literally would only take less than 1%, you know, maybe only 0.75% or a bit less of people dumping their BTC into BCH from the total pot. And that's already uh, balanced the scales. And if it's any more, then BCH will rise relative to uh, BTC. Of course, people can sell for fiat or they can do other things, right? But that would be the that would be the, the kind of uh, element to it. And this is now very wild speculation rather than just speculation. But um, I believe I have a very vague memory that there was something said somewhere 
that Roger Roger Veer had like twenty thousand BTC or something like that credited from this hundred forty thousand. Like he was one of the biggest ones. So if that's the case, then literally only a tiny amount of that stack, like you know five hundred BTC or something, out of that whole twenty thousand he could convert and just cancel out everyone else on his own even before anybody else was even involved so of course i maybe i'm remembering this number wrong maybe it's not even right i don't know how the payouts are being distributed or whatever but if he gets a fat stack and just flips over a tiny little bit of it then this is not going to be a problem for us and if he really goes hard and he starts like <laughs> dumping he suddenly gets a fresh load of cash and he's like well time to you know start a bit of the flipping then uh we could be seeing some action because that's a that's a lot of btc um have they given know, a date chain they i think they were going to do it this month it was like oh. july the the something so i guess i guess we'll wait and see whether or not that um that plays out but yeah of course they've been saying one of the funniest things about it was that the the lawyer who wrote the letter on it his name something or other kobayashi the the japanese lawyer which is the same name as the lawyer in the usual suspects so it's just like <laughs> we definitely live in a simulation confirmed yet again kobayashi the fake scam lawyer from the usual suspects is also the japanese lawyer <laughs> distributing the mount Gox payments you actually cannot make this stuff up <laughs> uh, all right uh brilliant so that's uh, a few bits of uh news for everyone and again yeah i'm going to be super interested we will talk about it a little bit on this show whatever happens at the bbc conference but i sort of feel like this is their chance to really surprise me and come up with something like wow bbc still has some life in it but if it's just more of the same rehash stuff that we've seen year after year and cultish laser eyes then they're going to be looking in a very rough spot i think okay so speaking of that we really have been on this show especially recently there hasn't been so much need to uh dunk on all these btc guys to the extent that i have been doing it it's been just one kind of slide sort of at the end of the show or something like one topic it hasn't been a big focus of what we've been talking about for a long time because it's just so irrelevant but the last couple of weeks we've really started to see the whole lie and scam of btc really start to fall apart in the minds of the btc people and without much prompting for i'd say from me i've been busy coding celine or anybody else in the bch community of course people are always talking on twitter and so forth but for the most part you know everybody's been busy at bliss we've been doing our own thing but reality is starting to <laughs> create its own uh, problems for them. So we're seeing live in action uh, how a kind of information bubble pops and reality just sets in on a group of people that have been quite deluded about their situation for a long time. And then they sort of suddenly realize, are we the bad guys? Or they realize, wait, we've been wrong this whole time. Or they start having realizations like, oh, guys, I just figured out X, Y, and Z. And everyone's like, no shit, Sherlock. We told you that for five years and you told us we were wrong. But now you're here for your come up. And so the reason I was talking about the US elections earlier before is perfectly timed. We've just had in the last couple of days, the US presidential debate which was moved forward between joe biden and donald trump it's about 90 minutes and it's available on youtube it was run by cnn and there was a lot of accusations about would it be fair and blah 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 blah. but they actually did a pretty good job uh to be to be fair to uh cnn and uh joe biden just basically failed so hard he was just unable to keep strings of thought together he sort of looked feeble and super old and just generally looked like he was not really capable of running the country now at his current age of i think 82 let alone for the next four years on top of that now this has not been news to anybody who's been paying attention <laughs> to US politics at all. This has been very obvious and well known around the world. But the Democratic Party in America have done a fairly good job of propagandizing 
their own constituents to the extent that no no it's all fine he's actually good and you know being in bed with the media and stuff to try and cover it up or run cover fire and excuses for his declining mental state and i guess to some extent his physical state as well too so we have a clip here from david sachs who is a sort of vc rich investor type guy on the all-in podcast if you want to find out more about all this u.s politics if you're not in the loop with all that i do recommend this all-in podcast and also scott adams if you look up some of his uh, daily streams coffee with scott adams you can get you can get into all of this uh, but he is here with a quick explanation of what has happened so the twitter democratic yeah the the twitter uh, clip there. I've also got a link to the YouTube, which is the full thing for people who want to look into that. And so let's have a quick listen to that. But before we do, the point that I'm going to make about this entire thing is that this is literally the exact same thing that is happening with the BTC maximalists and Blockstream, who are a front for the bankers. They essentially are the ones controlling things behind the scene. And then Bitcoin Core is their kind of front, that there's a few power players in that that are a bit more publicly visible. And then they run these kind of cons about the Lightning Network and about we need small blocks or decentralization will die and all that stuff with the cooperation of the media, which in the Bitcoin case is uh, Bitcoin. It was Twitter before, um, you know, Jack Dorsey got kicked out and he was busy censoring, you know, Bitcoin Cash never had its own topic and the block size was booked and all these scams, which has now started to come undone with the publishing of hijacking Bitcoin and all that. And then you have the rank and file who are sort of the podcasters who, who then uh, broadcast that set of lies and bullshit, you know, out to the average BTC hodler who is in this state of disillusioned reality about everything or delusional i guess uh reality about everything and they have zero idea of what's actually happening in reality so this is a well-known uh thing obviously it's not new to anybody on this show that this is like what's happening but we're just going to document and show here how it's all melting down for the btc guys so that hopefully this is a bit of a compilation that people can send just on twitter threads like oh you're in this uh uh, in, in unreality bubble, here you go, <laughs> look at this and, and wake up. And also to show that this same thing is happening with the Democratic Party right now in the US elections. And it was the same thing that happened with COVID. It's the same thing that happens over and over again with any of these kind of mass hysterias or propaganda campaigns. So it's quite important for the Bitcoin casualties to understand how these things play out so that we can avoid, obviously, any of these tactics being used against BCH as it was in the past and probably undoubtedly as people will attempt to in the future. So let's have a listen to David Sachs here about the Democratic Party. Collection of interests who want to remain in power. The Democratic Party is the party of government. Its goal is to allocate money and power from the government to the collection of interests who back the Democratic Party. In other words, it's basically a, a collection of, of interests who want to loot the republic. Well, obviously, no one's going to vote for that. So they have to make it about something else. They choose a figurehead. They talk about how this is about saving democracy. They basically invent hoax after hoax, lie after lie to basically maintain their power. And I think what's happened is the mask has come off. The whole thing, the whole shell game has been revealed. It's obvious that Biden was always a puppet for these interests who are hiding behind him. And now it's all being exposed. So there you go. That's that's kind of it in a nutshell. And you could play that same clip and just have him saying the exact same things, but just sub in like Blockstream are the ones controlling the strings. They have Bitcoin Core. They have the power brokers behind the scenes. They put out all these hoaxes to the end users. They have some kind of other, you know, cover narrative, which in their case is store of value and how that's going to be the be all and end all. And if you have sound money or, or whatever, you know, Michael Saylor is kind of like the Biden equivalent or the front man who just shills this and that endlessly uh, to the plebs, uh, the taco holding node runner plebs who then all nod along like this all makes sense and it gets reinforced by the uh, the podcasters and so forth in the BTC scene, all this disinformation. And then at the end of the day, eventually reality kind of pricks the bubble, uh, word starts to 
get in from the outside because you can only uh, fool, you know, they say you can fool everyone all of the time. You can fool everyone some of the time or some of the people all of the time, but not everyone all of the time. So eventually some reality seeps into this completely fake narrative and then the entire thing collapses as uh, the rank and file suddenly wake up like, oh my God, what's going on? Who could have seen this coming? Blah, blah, blah. And everybody on the outside is like, yeah, that's really obvious. So we've seen that obviously recently with the Craig Wright uh, thing, BSV, that was a whole scam, well documented, well pointed out by many people, but the people who were in the BSV community couldn't see it until finally there was that court case and it all sort of came out to an extent that it's finally penetrated their minds like wait we're where we're the bad guys we're on the wrong side and then they suddenly have this whole moment of like holy shit how have i been wrong about this the whole time well that's the same thing that's happening with the democrat uh media in the us with all the commentators and stuff it's only like how could we have known that joe biden was unfeeble it was too feeble and unfit to run as president and Who's been running the country this whole time if he was, uh, you know, completely unable, unable to do it and so forth? And it's like, but it's their own team that have been gaslighting them. So they need to work through like, wait, it was our own sources of information that we trusted that lied to us. It wasn't even just an accident or they got it wrong or the information wasn't available. No, it was definitely available. And in this case, all the Republicans knew about it, just like in the BTC case, all the BCHs and all of the rest of crypto knows that this whole store of value, Michael Saylor stuff is basically just gaslighting and talking his own book. But when you're the inside the information bubble, that comes as a huge uh, shock to you once there's a, like a critical tipping point, which in this case happened to be the presidential debate where it's just the truth is so obvious that all of the little NPC crowd followers finally realize like, wait, is, is this the truth? Is this what we have been betting all our uh, credibility on? <laughs> and then they need to sort of figure out how could they have been unaware that reality was completely different to to what they believed, right? So that's that's kind of the context of, of what's going on. Chet, get in here a little bit and tell me, is this an accurate analogy or par you know parallel that I'm drawing? Yeah, I think so. Uh, have you seen the Time Magazine cover? No, what, what one's that? So it was like, I saw it immediately after I watched the debate. It's got, it's all red. It's got Biden on it, like kind of walking off the frame. And the only word on it, aside from time at the top, is on the complete other side of the cover. It just says panic. And <laughs> I feel like, like you said, that tipping point moment, like was there for the world to see. And when, when we have that tipping point moment happen with BCH, we're going to need to use that cover. We're going to need to make some memes. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll have it. We'll have them all uh, stocked up and in preparation. Of course, there's there's an element uh, again for people who want to go and look into this. Like I said, you go look up Scott Adams on Twitter and uh, look into it. You know, he's he loves all this stuff, right? So he's uh, doing documenting and he's like sarcastically retweeting all these Democrat people who are like, "Oh, can you believe these George Orwell quotes? Like the party told the people to reject the evidence of their own eyes and ears. Wow, like what a genius!" And it's like, well. That is literally what the Republican commenters have been saying to this person having this grand moment of insight uh, like for the last five years. And they're always like, oh, these shitty Republican shills or idiots or whatever. And then finally, of course, like, like it tends to be, like you said, a very sudden reversal. There's a tipping point moment at which suddenly the penny drops and it's like the scales fall from their eyes. It's not, it's usually not like step by step by step it kind of goes step by step by step. The doubts kind of creep in and then there's a bit of, mm, I don't know, and there's a bit of copium and explaining things away and so forth and so forth. And then there's a critical moment at which it's just like, fuck, guys, I was completely wrong. And we've seen that in the in the BCH case, like, for instance, with uh, Ray Yusuf, he went through that whole period of, yeah, I don't know, guys, like, mm, seems something's a bit wrong. Why are all the laser eyes salty when I'm trying to make a medium of exchange, da, da, da. And then he just finally made a post which I shouted him out for. It was a great, great one where he said, okay, guys, I was fooled. I was late to the party here. Fuck me. I was wrong. And credit to him because he straight up 
realized it, you know it's like reality has not changed when you're the one having that moment and everybody does to be fair right i'm not i'm not immune to this nobody is immune to this it's just on different subjects at different times is when you're the one who has that moment what you have to realize is that reality hasn't changed you have like people get into this trap sometimes where they figure it out and then they think oh, I figured it out at the exact moment that it changed. And that's their story to themselves when you need to understand, no, everybody else or a lot of other people, especially people you probably mocked or pushed back on or didn't listen to, had had been living in that reality that whole time. And so you kind of need to take an L and say, okay, guys, you had it right and I had it wrong because you're never going to be able to rework things productively for yourself from that point forward unless you can see it through that lens of here's the story and here's where I caught up to it rather than the story changed and I happened to be at the exact right moment conveniently for my ego, you know? <laughs> uh, one Another parallel that I'm just kind of thinking of is like there was a moment where Biden was like the U.S. Border Patrol has endorsed me. Uh, and then the next morning they put out the tweet that was like, just to be clear, we have never <laughs> endorsed Biden. And it makes me think of Craig Wright being like, I own these addresses. And then those addresses signing a message, it's like Craig Wright is a liar and a fraud and not Satoshi. Has there ever been something like that in the BTC realm where someone's like making this outrageous claim and then ha like an address signs and says, uh, fuck no. Hmm. That's a good, that's a good question. I mean, there's been plenty of lies that have been totally exposed. Like, well, we did that. We did that segment on the show. You remember with Pete Rizzo at the start of this year, where he had his whole story about the, the, the BCHs, they're in a different reality, man. They're uh, listening to different podcasts and what, whatever it is that he says. And then he explains all those things about like, well, we had this block size increase, but the BCHs couldn't accept a reality that was different to theirs. And then he gives this all these gaslighting, like lies, like one after another that are yeah. all just patently false. They're all provably anybody can go look, you know, look that stuff up and just see that exactly what I explained was what's what actually happened. And obviously it's now all documented in hijacking Bitcoin as well, too. But all the all the narrative rewriting. But yeah, that I mean, the whole like segment was a block size increase. That's a complete sale. Like that was that's that's one of these hoaxes, right? Just like Joe Biden is fine. And the thing is, here's one other uh, point that's important to note about these uh, information bubble pops is you still have the last rats on the ship. So after this debate, Jill Biden, Joe Biden's wife, was at this uh, post event and she does this super patronizing thing where she says, like, you did, such you a did it, Joe. You answered all the questions. <laughs> like treating him like like he's about three years old because maybe his mental state is is at about that kind of level of awareness, right? And like the, all the people in the crowd are like, yay, Joe Biden, you know? And it's like they are still in that deluded reality. But what has happened is once the bubble pops, it just collapses down very quickly to just this tiny little group of people who are still inside with their minds still trapped in that, you know, fake reality, right? And so that's what we're going to see at some point with BTC, right? There'll be there'll be a moment like when BCH hits 0.1 BTC or when it hits 0.5 or when it hits 0.9 or maybe when the flipping happens and the the price of BTC, the whole chain clogs up, all the flipping stuff that I explained on episode 85, there's going to be a moment when that kicks in or maybe slightly before where everyone in quotation marks in the BTC community has like a snap to reality moment but some of them will be left behind and they're, they're not going to make it over that that jump and they're going to have just a really, really hard time in the following period after that until eventually they one by one, you know, figure it out. But that's going to take them a long time and with insane pain and nobody's really going to care because after the first round of I told you so's, everyone moves on to the next topic, you know. I think there's going to be so much extreme cognitive dissonance too. You're going to have people where after BTC like shits the bed completely, F shits the bed so hard the bed falls out from underneath it. Like you're going to have people going, well, you know, Bitcoin served its place. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, they're just people that haven't realized that they're fiat maximalists. They're going to be like, Bitcoin served its place. We accomplished X, Y, Z. Peer-to-peer payments are so much easier nowadays. Like, we don't need this uh, uh, inefficient uh, data space any or da database anymore. And it's still going to be like, I 
I did the right actions at the right time all of the time. Uh, yeah, that's what I was saying about that yeah. narrative of like, even once reality just like crams reality down your throat, it's like, well, it changed, but it changed at the exact moment that I changed my mind. And so I was therefore justified right up until things changed. Then reality changed. So I, of course, changed my behavior, very reasonable of me, and, uh, you know, was correct not only up until that moment, but also afterwards because I just adjusted with the changing information when it's yeah. it, you know, not true. I think the distinction is like one one very small degree of separation where it's like as the ball is rolling, like when whenever they change their mind, it's like, okay, now now we're on this different path. Like there's something that's actually different. The person that I'm talking about are like they will write it down to zero till the very end. And they're still going to believe that they did the right thing. Like the whole time. Well, there's still BSV people like that, right? Right. We've yeah. seen even after yeah. the BSV community have had this moment, there's not many of them left, right? A lot of it has all just gone completely. And a lot of them have had, you know, their comeuppance either internally or, you know, publicly. And then, but there's still a few that are still in there like BSV is the real Bitcoin. Like we're going to, Craig Wright just wasn't recognized by the courts and he's going to come back, guys. Just wait and see. Like, yeah, some people just go to zero. Yeah, it was like uh, two weeks ago. I found a BSV account that I had never seen before in my life, and I went through their tweets, and they were like very still pro BSV, and they weren't getting like any engagement. And it, I, I, I actually felt bad because it's like this person's just screaming in a silo. Like, there's no, like, how do you, how do you even approach this person to be like, hey, like for the benefit of your own mental health, maybe just take a week off. Like, just stop thinking about this so much. Yeah, and people will write that off sometimes and be like, oh, it's just bots or it's Calvin Chills. No, this is real people. Like one of the yeah. things that was said about uh, Twitter when they were trying to like clean up the bots was that, you know, people act like bots. And I'm not even just saying that to be dismissive or like, haha, people are NPCs or anything, but they genuinely do. Like they found uh, an account of that tweeted, you know, the weather in Surrey every day at like 6 p.m. on the dot or something like that. And they were like, this is just Frankie and the Bandit. And then, yeah, it was just like some old lady who was obsessed yeah. with the weather and had been for 30 years. And she just did that every day very happily. That was her thing that she liked doing. And then yeah. she complained and was like, why did you ban my account for being a bot? I'm not a bot. Like, they talk to her. And people behave like bots. They make nonsensical statements that look like they could, could have come out of chat GPT nonsense. You know, they have all kinds of stupid contradictory opinions and don't see the difference. They have random schedules that they post at or all kinds of stuff. Like, so it's very hard to tell people <laughs> and what's apart in some, in some ways. And that, yeah, that, I'm sure there are a couple of people trapped in that little BSV mindset and there's going to be some in B2C after it all goes kaboom too, right? Yeah, that reminds me. There's a few people that I haven't spoken to in a couple of years that I should probably reach out to and be like, "Hey, how have things how been?" BCH is still low. Yeah. If you're interested in a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized currency. Yeah, well, we're always here, and that's and that's also one reason that I'm really glad we have the show because for people like that, if they ever wonder like what the hell happened, all the episodes of the show are there. And if they really want to do the work, they can go back and listen to it all. And we've covered it all in real time, <laughs> what's actually happening. And so they can listen to that and then compare it to their memory of what was going on. And then maybe with some fresh information, kind of fuse that together to figure out an actual coherent uh narrative of, of what happened uh, but that's much harder to do if you don't have that historical data source to compare against it and obviously that's only for people the minority of people who do want to make the effort to actually uh, figure it out and they don't just keep coping or sweep it under the bed you know they actually want to learn some lessons and avoid it happening in the future but i'm glad it's there for those people okay so like i said in the last couple of weeks we've really started to see these realities set in on the btc community so let's take a look at a few examples and in the past we've often done one example at a time or something but here we're just going to do like a, a, a sequence of them and you can see it happening from every different angle so the first one is actually a clip involving 
me, uh, which is I just recently finished my three part six hour plus debate with Lorenzo Ray on Joel Valenzuela's channel. The full things are up there and you can go and watch the whole six hours. I know it was quite popular, like a bunch of people would watch different segments of it. And we will hopefully, I think, get around to republishing the whole thing as just one uh, video on this channel. So if you want to listen to all that, you can. But I can save you basically six hours of time uh, and I've cut it down to there was just a two and a half little minute segment that just perfectly encapsulated the whole debate, which was where I was trying to take some BCH uh, donations and Lorenzo was trying to take some B2C donations. And obviously BCH worked flawlessly <laughs> and B2C kind of didn't. And this wasn't a planned thing that we had. So it just organically happened and it just proved the exact point like live on the spot in an unedited way. So we've got a little clip of that, which cuts together a couple of parts of the um, of the debate there. People in the comments who are asking for donation addresses and they said, you know, well, wow, this guy, dude, these freaking names are so long. I can't even. Let's go, answer. baby. He says, if uh, if I send you thirty dollars, can you afford ten to Lorenzo via Lightning and ten to Jeremy? The for the second part of that question, yes. For the first part, um, I was using Phoenix Wallet, and I'm unfortunately in the U.S. where it's banned now. So, oh, I and I just check on chain fees; they're like five bucks. So. R.I.P. There we go. Know, Case closed. <laughs> I win the debate. <laughs> Done. Well, for, in um. So basically, I'll, I could find a way if you want to do that. But alternatively, you could both post your whatever addresses yeah. in the comments of YouTube. This is specifically, by the way. Yeah, yeah, sure. sure, sure. Uh, uh... But if anyone has any questions from the audience, uh, feel free to hit them in. In the meantime, um, we can wrap it up since it's like an hour, 23 minutes. But we could also, like, if you guys no, no, we got I got to got to see the new Shay you wanted to jump into. Now's <laughs> yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah. Now's the time while people get their yeah. Quick, quick thing. Uh, yeah. uh, it does the person will the person accept a lightning invoice or he he's donating some other crypto and then uh, so because I can send a lightning invoice. Uh, yeah. So Jingle Bob, what do you think? Just let let me know while you're doing this in case he. He's still watching. He might have just taken off. Uh, uh, by the way, a, a friend of mine just chimed in. Says, greeting from the People's Republic of Canada. Good seeing you, dude. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. Um, okay. well, isn't or so if, he can, yeah. if he wants to send me some other crypto, you know, I'll happily check it in my Binance account, trade it for BTC, and withdraw the aligning to my non-custodial lightning wallet. So I can also do that. Oh, look, there we go. I just got, uh, just got some donations. Thank you very much, uh, viewer for uh, donating me some BCH. Point for BCH. Uh, the YouTube uh, yes. chat doesn't allow me to post my full lightning invoice because it's too long. So I have Rip to post <laughs> twice and then the, the donor has to, you know, reattach them together. So yeah, these lightning invoices are way too long. We need to fix that. I got another uh, donation, by the way. So thank you to the other. Uh... Nice. So just at the end there, uh, Jingle Bob said, uh, Lorenzo post a, a BTC address, I'll just eat the on-chain fee. And then Lorenzo says, yeah, thanks, man. So they did sort it out in the chat. And I guess uh, Jingle Bob ended up paying a $5 on-chain transaction fee to send $10 because the Lightning Network just wasn't workable. Meanwhile, I had just received two donations, no problem, exactly like that. This is a completely unplanned, fair test on a neutral channel BCH just works. It just works. That's what the BCH community has been saying since the fucking beginning. And uh, BTC just doesn't when it comes to it. There's some problems. There's some issues. There's some excuses. There's all oh, the on-chain fees are high. Oh, my non-custodial Phoenix wallet has been banned in the US because it was all a bit dodgy. Like there's just problem after problem after problem. So, yeah, exactly. Well, it's it's sendership resistant because you can't even fucking send it anywhere. And that's that's just a classic example, right, that uh, we happen to catch on this stream. So I edited together these clips and I, I posted it up and I said, you know, look, here's an example of just BCH works and BDC doesn't. And, you know, 
credit to Lorenzo for doing the debates with me and everything like that. I actually think overall it was actually a pretty good debate. He was actually quite reasonable uh, and he actually delivered and followed through on the debates, unlike some of these other guys who you know we've invited on the show and there's been other things they've always fallen through. He did actually turn up for it, so props to him for that. But uh, in this kind of scenario where it's just clear, it's just clear that he's wrong. There's no question about it. Instead of just taking the L and being like, okay, maybe BBC isn't working, he just had to go back and keep rewriting the narrative and finding excuses and all this. I've got some comments here on the slides. I'm not going to read them all out, but he basically said, look, the world wants store of value. They don't care about medium of exchange. That'll come later, blah, blah, blah. And I said, look, you couldn't store any value in your currency because you couldn't even receive it, right? It's just obvious right there. And then he said, well, the audience of the show was mostly BCH people, which it might have been, but if it was, one, that's irrelevant. Whether the BTC or BCH network is functioning is not related to who is watching a podcast. And two, even if that was the case, that was just because I did a better job of promoting the stream than he did. And he was big upping himself as I'm this big uh, TikTok uh, influencer of BTC and I've got 100K followers and stuff like that. If he didn't have any BTC people in the debate that could do a quick demonstration and show that, that B BTC was working great, that's on him. That's not on me. It's not my job to get the audience to come in from the BTC side. That's the whole point of a BTC to BCH debate. He's got to bring the BTC audience. So it's a nonsense excuse anyway. But even if they had, like we had somebody there who was obviously a crypto user, was happy to send him BTC in whatever way he wanted. Lightning Network wasn't feasible. They paid an on-chain fee, which was clearly not economically viable, only just because that user took pity. Did it even make any sense at all? And so it's just like, it's just it's just that simple. Reality is starting to speak louder than anybody can really hide anymore, no matter how much on these podcasts or Twitter threads, they're saying, no, BTC is the best, BTC is the best. Now that we have clips increasingly like this, you can just post that in the Twitter thread and that's just it. The debate is over. There's no arguing with that. It's, it's incontrovertible, right? But then Lorenzo just still cannot see it. He cannot accept and just take an L and say, you know what, Jeremy, you you were right. You were right. It's not it's not working. Maybe I need to rethink my point of view. Maybe even if BTC is a great store of value, it's not going to be workable as money until we fix these issues. But of course, once he starts digging into that onion and peeling back those layers, it all just turns into, well, read hijacking Bitcoin and listen to the whole history of the Bitcoin Cash podcast and hello, you're back to reality. But that's just you know, nine years of context that he has to take an L on before he can move forward, right? Yeah, yeah especially for people that aren't used to accepting that they've held a long, like uh, held a belief for a long period of time that was incorrect and then spent the time, not just to be like, oh, this is wrong, but how does this impact my life? Here's how I'm going to change my life with this new, like the integration part of it's so difficult. So if like this is your first time, you're like, oh shit, <laughs> I don't know if there's much to save like i feel like it's uh can't teach an old dog new tricks yeah 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 and that's it and it's just like change happens when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of changing and right now he's presumably not sending that many btc transactions in his daily life he's running his node he's shilling to his tiktok followers who whatever are in the same cult and they believe it a lot of it or, or whatever but they're not actually using this on a daily basis because if they would, they would be running into these problems and thinking this is unacceptable, but they're just not. And so then that's when the opportunity presents for it to be proven, it fails. And then he's like, oh, and he has to come up with excuses and so forth later. Okay, so that's that's just that's just one example, but that was obviously involving me. This is not just me dunking on Lorenzo, the, the word is starting to get out because this reality is reality. So every day people are trying to use the BTC network and they're discovering that it's not working no matter how much propaganda they're being fed. So we have an example here from another guy who's a developer working on some kind of stuff with the El Salvador. And he also had some thoughts on the current, current state of uh, BTC. So let's have a look at what, what he had to say. Salvador isn't ready for Bitcoin. It's Bitcoin isn't ready for El Salvador. 
it's us Bitcoin developers who are failing you guys. Uh, and I am, I firmly believe this. So, so, so we can, we can, we can separate two, two things here, the store of value and medium of exchange, right? So on a store of value, Bitcoin is kicking ass, but on the medium of exchange property, how fast, how cheap, how anonymously you can send money to other people and how easily, well, Bitcoin is not doing well, not even with the lightning network. Is failing a lot. Us Bitcoin developers are failing you in 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 this sense. But uh, hopefully we we can we can come up with something. The thing is, it's not that as see that. And the thing is, they did come up with something, and that's what I posted in this thread. Got a lot of likes uh, where I said the Bitcoin developers did come up with something. It's called BCH. BCH is the fix. The community that realized, okay, you need to raise the block size, and you need to you know, reverse RBF and uh, take that out and you need to not do SegWit and you need to not go down this huge propagandized rabbit hole in the first place, right? That that was the fix. But here this guy is years and years and years later, and I don't know how long he's been involved in BDC, so he might not have been there for all of it, but he's going to keep running his head into this wall that BTC is not workable as a medium of exchange until not just, it's like in his mind, it's like, well, there must be some small problem here and we can tinker this or we can tweak this or we can fix this and just get past this one next little technical problem. But that's not it. It's the huge stack of lies and assumptions and everything everything that's built on it you know you just it's like mentally kicking the can down the road just a little bit just like with joe biden you know maybe the, all the people who were putting him up on that stage well that was probably deliberate because they probably wanted to kick him out the powers that are actually running the show but at some of the people involved somewhere along the line were telling themselves no it's not that bad it's just a little you know it's just workable we just had a bad day he's just a bit out of it he's a bit sick he's a bit tired he's whatever and they just could find excuses and hopes for the mounting continuous evidence that it just is not working and insanity is doing the same thing expecting different results and that's the btc community the ones who are genuinely like this guy and honestly trying to make it work is they're working hard and they're trying to figure out a way to uh, get the BDC to work as a medium of exchange, but it's never going to happen because it has been deliberately and systematically undermined so that it will not work, which is what the BCH community have been telling them and what they would have to take a huge humbling L and rework their whole narrative of all of the cryptocurrency and all their emotional investment, probably life decisions that they've made, how many hundreds of hours has this guy spent programming on these apps trying to figure it out, you know, and this idea of Bitcoin is failing, like he's able to say that now i don't know he's got like seventeen thousand twitter followers he's sort of you know must be some sort of minor influencer in the btc side of thing probably spent years of his life probably lots of his friends are in the btc community probably feels it's a big part of his identity he's told his family and all that that he's big into bitcoin and he's tried to shill it to them and get it to work and so on and so forth and just the emotional damage of even just admitting admitting is the first step right even just admitting that it's failing is like after seven years of all this gaslighting, I know Bitcoin's perfect and it's immutable money and it's going to take over the world. And they'll often say something like, yeah, well, we're working on it, guys. We'll get there in the end. You know, it's not perfect yet, but it will be by the time it's ready for, you know, billions of people in 20 years time or whatever. But like I've explained on that show, no, the shot is now. Now is the time. There is no, I'm 25, but I'll be ready to be in the NBA by the time I'm 45. No. Nope. By that point, you're too old and you've missed it. And some of the 25 year old is in there today. And by the time you're 45, there'll be five more generations that are in there. That's exactly what's happening. And they don't have that kind of time. We saw with Apple rolling out Apple Pay, you know, so on and so forth, right? So for him to actually understand, to rework his whole assumption that we can do store of value and medium of exchange is just a technical fix and to switch it around, medium of exchange is what you've got to get to work and then store of value comes from people flooding in to use it as a medium of exchange, just requires him to rewrite so much of his own mental narrative, right? And that's a very, very hard um, pill to swallow. Of course, this stuff with El Salvador completely failing is exactly what the BCH community 
said, you know, that it wouldn't work. It would devolve into custodial solutions, which it has with the Chivo wallet. Bukele hasn't been very transparent. Most of the users just cashed out their free crypto as fast as possible into fiat. As far as I'm aware, there's no sizable, there might be some sort of Bitcoin to Bitcoin economy going on there, like a little bit, but nothing, nothing serious, nothing on the scale of what was the grand vision, you know, three years ago, it was 2021, right? When this was all getting hyped around the time of the BTC conference in 2021, right? So three years later, it just is not working. And of course, eventually they keep running into that wall. Sooner or later, you get frustrated enough that you ask, what am I doing wrong? And the answer is not just a small fix to Lightning Network, mate. I hate to say it, but it's not. It's actually BCH and you've got to rethink everything from first principles. What did you get from this clip? I saw this one, I think like the day that it was kind of going around. Um, and I don't know what there is to hold on to. Like, <laughs> I think uh, of the whole like splits being bad breakups and whatnot. And like BTC is the breakup that shouldn't that should happen but hasn't, right? Like, <laughs> uh, what what is going? Like, I don't. Yeah, what is there to hold on to? Why are people still clutching to BTC? Like, what is the hope? Like. We're going to do this eventually? When? How many years are we going to be like, yeah, we'll do this eventually? Well, it's the brand. There's a lot of things that you can, like, to steel man the case, there's a lot of things that you can use to sort of reinforce your coke. Now, to be honest, obviously, I don't agree with anything. I think this is a complete coke. But if you're smart enough, you, you can be smart enough to fuel your own copes, you know? And like Eric Wall is a classic example of this. Why doesn't he just switch sides? He's clearly got it. Are we the bad guys? And he realized, yes, we are, right? But he's still in his own mind. I'm sure what he's thinking to himself is the network effect is so valuable. If we switch to BCH, we can never catch up to that. Of course, it's the other way around. The network effect is actually what's ossifying them into an unworkable situation on BBC and BCH while it's hard, hard work to accept, okay, we're going to have to start again from, not from scratch exactly, but we're going to have to take a few steps, you know, two steps back to get five steps forward. Um, that's a hard thing to swallow. Oh, the brand clout is still enormous. The personal ego cost of I was wrong and I told all these guys they were shit coiners for seven years and that, you know, was a completely fake and I need have egg on my face for all of that. Like I said, the personal social networks and reputation, like all of my friends who all agree with me that B2C is the way are all going to be, I'm going to be the outcast from all of that. There's so many layers of thing excuses that you can use which is why it takes such a high threshold of years and years and years and years of failing before the pain gets so high that they're willing to accept making that alternative sacrifice to actually move beyond beyond that roadblock right i think that's that's kind of the summary that makes sense um I, like thinking specifically about the breakups too like i don't i feel like i'm a lot more eager to be like this clearly isn't working out like something's <laughs> nothing's changing here let's uh just part part ways ha amicably and you know be happy with that uh and maybe this is just a personality difference like i don't know i don't know well the sunk cost fallacy is a thing for a reason right yeah. humans have an inbuilt bias to keep doing whatever they've been doing and yeah. especially if you are the kind of person that has an internal locus of control, which is usually quite healthy, then you feel like I can change this. I can improve things. I can work through this. And in the BTC case, the BTC community as a whole can figure out a way past this roadblock. Oh, wait, hold on. Do you think the, do you think the promise, like the hope in the future is that we get more people on it? Uh, do you think it's, to make it more valuable or do you think it is some combination of the two like well the it, real it, it drive varies well it varies from person to person but there's a, a large segment that are in it for let's just get rich in fiat number go up and i really respect someone like brian uh who we talk to on twitter spaces sometimes who he's at least transparent about that he's like that's what i'm here for and he doesn't have all these delusions about all this other stuff then you have some people who have that motivation subconsciously but consciously they need to justify it as i'm this really principled bitcoiner from the early days and i'm a cypherpunk and blah 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 
even though it, it's nothing like that project and they either weren't there or they found some way to convince themselves that they went with the sheep rather than stood up, you know, like a courageous individual and stuck to the principles that they were espousing because, again, then they would have to admit the BCHs were right and they were wrong and blah, 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 all that other stuff, right? So it's a bit of a combination. But I think, like, this guy seems very genuine to me, right? When he's saying this stuff, we're failing. It's not that El Salvador is failing. We're failing El Salvador. We're not providing a good enough service, a good enough experience, something that would genuinely motivate people in El Salvador, poor people on the ground who need these tools, who everybody has been saying are not going to be able to use this store of value bullcrap that is uh, slow and expensive and reversible and custodially held by your you know, authoritarian government. Like that's just not going to work. But uh, yeah, they wanted to. They wanted to so badly. Yeah. Have you followed El Salvador stuff? Like, I remember we had spoke about the Chivo wallet having a bunch of bugs. Um, is it is it the case? Do I have it like in my head correct that like the only legal way to use Bitcoin is to use their Chivo wallet? No, I think you can use anything you want. It's just that the Chivo wallet was how you got the $30 airdrop custodially which people then immediately cashed out and i also think like when uh mark falzon was there i don't remember the spe specifics but there was like the bitcoin beach app which i'm not sure if that's i feel like that's kind of different but maybe somehow related to chivo wallet and that was needed to pay kind of like how we had to use the bitcoin.com wallet for some right. stuff in ljubljana like they had some kind of setup like that like you specifically needed these specific wallets because it wasn't all just operating on the base BCH protocol, you know, so hmm. I think there was a there was a bit of an element of that, basically. I was asking because I'm curious, like, how much is it that it's, you know, Chivo failing? How much of it is Lightning failing? And then how much of it is like Lee base chain is failing? Obviously, well, I think it's, it's all of them. It's right. it's all of them. It, and, and there's just such a pile of problems that <laughs> at, at, at any one time, it's like one part of it's failing or it's all failing. And so just there's no way to make because it's it's like poison. The tree is poisoned at the root. So yeah. it doesn't matter at what how big the branches grow or whatever. The poison still just seeps into there. Like uh, it's what Emergent Reason always says, you know, ex falso quad libet, right? From uh, falsehood, any any premise can emerge. Like once you start with one plus one equals three, you can come up with any system of mathematics that justifies whatever you're doing, but it's still all going to be fake because you've built it on these cornerstone lies. And that's what the whole hijacking Bitcoin is about, right? They have that fake belief in their mind that it's still decentralized, that it wasn't co-opted, that Blockstream didn't maliciously and nefariously jam up the works of the development process and its ability to be used as a P2P currency and so forth. And so because they have those fake false beliefs, that then leads to poor technical decisions with SegWit and RBF and so forth. And then that leads to them all justifying it on podcasts. And then that leads to the tech being broken. And then that leads to custodians in El Salvador. And then that leads to it not getting adopted. And then it leads to this guy making a video being like, what's going on? But he can't just dig one level deep. He has to dig through the entire stack and get to the bottom before he can rebuild a solid, you know, foundation, right? Yeah, which I, I think I saw a shadow post on Telegram, like a, essentially like agencies and the government have been doing to kind of uh, compromise conferences and things like that. And it talks about having uh, committees that are no smaller than five people to make sure that like things, you just have to make things big and complex and confusing enough that the average person, even if they want to dig, doesn't know where to start, right? Yeah, you just create uh, so much chaos and bureaucracy that, yeah, like well-intentioned people are just always stuck at the outside trying to like fix the things when the, the core of it is just a broken, twisted mess of wire that nobody can untangle, right, by design. And then everybody's busy, you know, painting the, the outside of the ship or whatever, and just the inside is just like it's never, ever going to fly. But as long as they don't realize that, they can happily work away on the, the corner edges without sort of confronting the the core of the issue, um, especially when they're being gaslit by, you know, the so-called senior engineers who are the ones standing next to the flaming wreckage of the internal system and telling them, no, no, it's fine. We're just the experts that will cover it, you know, that will uh, voodoo magic, make this work somehow. 
go back, go back to what you were doing. Nothing to, nothing to see here with the fireworks and the house exploding in the background. It's just that. Okay, we got we got the next one here is from Bitcoin Mechanic on the uh, Bitcoin Matrix podcast. Now there's a full episode with a couple of good clips in it, but this was just the one that got shared on Twitter and has some nice thematic music has been added to it. Um, but this is a you know still hitting on the same theme. So let's hear what he had to say. Do you see waiting to happen at the moment? If you can't have access to on-chain, if you can't run your own node, if there's only a couple of people making my templates, it just means that centralization. Bitcoin is a decentralized bank digital currency, right? Like, so if it becomes centralized, by definition, it is a central bank digital currency, right? And the minute you centralize it, it is that. Like, it, whoever that third party is that's handling your Bitcoin-related affairs for you is surveilling you, it's requiring your permission, it's going to ask for your ID, and it's smart money so it can do annoying things like give you UTXOs that can't be spent for a year or force you into multi-sigs that, you know, they have a key to and you have a key to. So you can only ever spend your money if you have their permission. Uh, programmatically rather than you know cash where you could spend it without their permission they just need to not find out like bitcoin stops being that kind of thing so yeah bitcoin is a cbdc waiting to happen it's a nightmare unless we get it back on track and this is this is so troublesome this is absolutely horrific but i'm sorry it's true i hate to say it it's it's just something we're sleepwalking into at the moment So there you have it. He's having a slightly different uh, set of problems to the previous guy that we had, where he's worried about the mining uh, pool central centralization, specifically the construction of the block templates. So even if there's lots of people that have their home Bitcoin miners and they're fairly distributed, or there's some small ones and some big ones and whatever, but if they're all mining at pools, which are the ones directing what actually goes into the block, and especially if several of the pools are just offshoots of um, one of the, you know, one of the pools, then it's really not that decentralized from a mining point of view. So with ocean mining and Luke Jr., he's trying to fix that by offering an alternative. Now he's fighting a good fight. He's onto something. I want to, you know, I think he's a great guy. I would love to have him in team BCH uh, because I think he's spot on. I think there is a really big problem here and he's he's really onto something. But, and I mean, he's even right about, he talks about in his mind, it goes back to the block size wars and the evil Chinese miners and Jihan Wu and stuff like that. And I even agree with him about that. Yeah, he's, he's probably spot on. Obviously, Jihan was on the big block. His eyes, a slightly different take on that. But in general, he's, he's actually correct that probably mining is overly centralized. It's a big issue. It really needs to be fixed and so forth. But the BCH community can't help out and can't fix that because we're too small and we're not enough of the hash rate for us to have the clout to really be able to make any difference. They're the ones that got all the price pumps and the money and the hash rate as they're so fond of reminding us. So we're not in a position to fight that battle. He is somewhat in a position to fight that battle, but he can't make any progress because it's the same things, just it's a, diff it's a different symptom of the same disease. He is trying to get the community to listen to him. What about these decentralized templates? What about changing the filters on our nodes? What about this and that? But because he just still has this incorrect narrative to himself that nodes are the ones that tell, you know, the truth to miners and that the whole BCH was just Roger Veer and Jihan Wu's evil corporate takeover and blah, 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 blah. Blockstream are the good guys. Luke Jr. is a smart guy that is actually working in the best interest of Bitcoin, which is it would be hard for him to unplug and say, no, wait, this guy was part of the sabotage because he works with him closely. He's probably his friend. He probably has a lot of good things going on with him. He's employed by him or directly involved with him or whatever. You know, so I'm sure he and Luke maybe even knows a lot about Bitcoin and has a lot of good ideas. And maybe he's not even maliciously involved in this so much as unintentionally or whatever. But the point is, because he just has this misconceived history of what's going on, he can't figure out why the Bitcoin project that he believed in, the BTC that it is now, is manifesting in a direction that doesn't fit his vision. Like, how is it that it's turning into this 
decent, you know, uh, CBDC style, like easily surveilled bullcrap with an entire community that it just seems oblivious to these issues that to him are really important. And they're just busy, happy with their number go up and repeating these same tropes over and over. It's because he was on the side that <laughs> that pushed all those narratives and led to driving out everyone who disagreed with those narratives and who was smart. There was a huge brain drain. And so he was left with all the morons that just repeated the propaganda, who then a bigger fish came along, Michael Saylor, and just shilled all this stupid stuff. And they all followed along like little lemmings, right? And so he was a big part of causing that situation, but because he doesn't really understand that in his own mind, he just cannot understand now when the results are plain in front of his face that this is the Bitcoin that he created and the people that agreed with him created as well too. And like he's just in a, as much of a tough situation as the other the other guys that we just looked at, like Lorenzo and like that other guy and like the Democrats who are waking up to this reality on the political front which is that for him to get past this roadblock, he's going to have to unwind layer after layer after layer of assumptions. Because if he listens to this show, he will think, no, 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 but I'm just going to, I just need to change this or I just need to find the right way to pitch filters to the BTC community and get that uh, adapted or we'll just find a different way. Or That's like thinking only one level deep. That's not the core of the issue. And so just fighting that, the battle at that level, it's like treating the symptoms instead of the disease. You know, if you just put cream on your skin over and over, but you actually have some kind of autoimmune disease, like your skin is just going to keep getting worse, no matter how many band-aids or creams or ointments you put on the skin. If the disease is internalized, that's what you need to fix at the core. Otherwise, you're just never going to be able to get past these problems. They're just going to keep recurring. And so he is just having an absolutely terrible time. And I feel bad for him because, again, he's sitting in his room like with his head in his hands, like trying to figure out what can we do? How can we fix this uh, problem? And that's before any of the other, you know, the other issues that are being had, just even just with the mining here. And then even worse, <laughs> gosh, it's just it's just layer upon layer. Even worse than this, and even more classic, is the response that he got from this clip, which is, I've got one here from John Carvalho, who re replied and said, quote, there is no track. Back on track, in quotation marks, just means off track, quotation marks, to the changes he wants. As far as I know, he mostly wants stupid changes that don't actually fix anything and make other things worse, end quote. And so this is another guy that is on his team, nominally, on Team BTC, is fighting him over his changes to try and fix BTC. So not only does he have to actually get the fix working, he has to convince a whole bunch of people that don't want to be convinced that his changes suck. And the most ironic thing about it is that John Carvalho is also unhappy with how BTC is. John Carvalho is like upset that RBF has got in and he thinks that things need to change and he's out there whinging away about BTC. But in John Carvalho's mind, his changes would be smart and mechanics changes are evil and stupid and bad. And why would you want to change Bitcoin in that way? And that just leaves them at this huge gridlock. It's like not even logically consistent. If John Carvalho said, nobody should make any changes, that's my position, fine. But his position is, well, we're kind of going in the wrong direction. So we do need to change something. And I've got some ideas. But also at the same time, anybody who has any different ideas, which are not high on my agenda, they must be stupid and idiots and just want to change something that's not going to make any difference. And he's not the only one either. Like Shinobi is classically also the same, who will just adopt any position that whatever Shinobi says that can make Shinobi sound condescending and arrogant about everybody else thinking that, you know, they're such a midwit and they should all just not try and change Bitcoin because who do they think they are? But he himself is like, we need CTV or we need whatever we need. And that's going to be the grand savior to save everything. And so they're just all in there together in this huge gridlock where everybody wants some changes, but nobody can agree on the right changes because nobody, again, nobody's treating the core disease. It's like the world's worst episode of House MD, you know, <laughs> person's like 
one person's like, oh, he's bleeding out of his uh, <laughs> One person's like, the skin is rotting off here. And one person's like, the you know, foot needs amputation. And they're all like focused on their tiny little part of the problem. Like, this is the problem. <laughs> it's lupus. It's never lupus, mate. Except for that one time, it's never lupus. When he just gets out the, the lupus textbook and he's like, they're like, you keep your drugs in a medical textbook? And he's like, it's never lupus. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a great uh, shout out, House MD. Great show. But uh, that's that's like what's happening. They're all looking at their individual symptom and none of them has had the moment of clarity. Like it's a systemic disease and we need to fix that. And then the, all the other things offshoots will will uh will be fixed but again like it's just the same as all the other people if he went down that rabbit hole far enough he would end up coming full circle to the big hashes were right and the whole history flows from 2015 and today you know in 2024 they're celebrating bliss and uh abla launch right he would if you de deconstruct everything that's the point that you get to and we've you know, the point of what I'm trying to show here as well is it's it's everyone, it's everywhere. All of them know that there is a problem. It's become undeniable. Lorenzo is like, these lightning invoices are not working. We've got to do something about it. That previous dev was like, look, we're not doing this medium of exchange. It's not working for El Salvador. Bitcoin mechanic is like, what's going on with the mining pools? Like, this is a mess. John Carvalho is like, the RBF is kind of screwed. Like, what are we doing here? Eric Wall and the Wizards that we had two episodes ago are like, we need OpCat, but we can't convince all these guys like it's a complete mess and we're trying to get them to listen and it's not fucking working. Like all of these guys all have different disagreements with each other about what the problem is, but they all know there's a problem and none of them are getting anywhere towards a solution because they all have these same copes and lies in their fundamental, you know, worldview, right? So... Yeah, I don't know. Uh, any comments on this this aspect of it? Not really. I just, I love how so much. <laughs> That's about it. I'm now just thinking, if this were a disease, which disease would it be? How do we, how do we die? It's it definitely some like autoimmune disorder, right? The organs are failing. Your eyes are sloughing out of your skull. Like. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, and it's, I mean, I don't, I was watching some House MD uh, clips recently, so. That's part of why I've seen that whole show like at least twice. It's such a good show. I, I think there's so many good, I mean, some parts of it are pretty cheesy, but the, the, there's so much in that show in that every episode is basically the same formula, but there's at the end, there's a couple of key, you know, patterns that'll always be like, wait, we had the answer at the start, but there was this one thing kind of covering it up. And so we were doing things and then we misattributed what we were doing. And then at the end, if you take away that one wrong assumption we made, boom, then everything else makes sense. Like there's often a kind of moment of clarity that they have like that, or they will have one where it's like, okay, he had disease A, but then he also had disease B and we were assuming it was one disease, but it was actually two. And if you break it down into those two different things, it's actually really easy to fix. Or, you know, there was some uh, factor that we didn't know about, like the guy was lying to us that he'd never had, yeah. you know, drugs because he was being a Christian pastor his whole life or something. And he promised he'd dead ex-girlfriend that he couldn't tell anyone or something. And if we'd figured that out, then it would have explained all this stuff. Like it's always comes down to having the wrong mental model and some kind of assumptions that then led you to be unable to find the root cause of the issue, you know? So there are so many episodes where, you know, he comes in and he promotes, pr proposes like two different sets of medicines. And then Cameron would be like, oh, if we give him this one, you're going to kill the patient. And then there's like, let's give him that one. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want him to suffer for the next six months in a hospital or you want to find out what's wrong with him? It's like, who's going to be that guy to step in for BTC and be like, listen, you guys are fucked up. <laughs> We're going to have to do some serious changes. It's not going to be pleasant. You might die. It's us, dude. The, we, we are. That's us. That's the role that we are playing with this and the BCH community generally. Right? But the reason we're doing this segment, one of the reasons, is that afterwards I can clip it out. It's going to be a long clip. It's going to be like a 30-minute clip or something like that and post it to all these guys and tag them all and say, watch this, guys, and they probably have me muted or blocked. Maybe they don't want to. But somebody will watch it and hopefully mention it to them or something, and at least one of them has got to just watch this 
who is doing this in the BTC community? Like, this is the Bitcoin Cash fucking podcast. This is not the BTC core, like, shill fest. How come they don't have a single person anywhere who would do what I've done and found this clip, this clip, this clip, this clip, and could just break it down point by point by point by point by point with the examples and what's wrong and how to fix it and everything like that. What they need, right? Yeah, even if they don't like what you have to say to just be like okay let's use this as the the launching pad and like start working on some of these problems yeah yeah exactly but again that that just that just triggers the whole cognitive dissonance is like how can these stupid b caches be seeing something that i that i can't you know obviously i have my version of the solution but if you're watching this guys you don't need to take my firstly don't trust verify all the clips are there all the research is there these are all people that you can talk directly to and will talk back they won't talk to me but they'll talk to you so you can get to the bottom of it a lot faster at least in theory if you weren't all so deluded but uh like you don't it's it's all there even if you don't agree with me on the solution or you can talk to me though i'm very happy to talk to any of you about it then uh, it, just take it as this is a problem. I'm seeing things clearly because I'm not as in the weeds and hopefully you can at least appreciate that there might be some objective merit to that. And it's not a case that they can dismiss. <laughs> Who's this guy, Jeremy? He doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, watch a bit of the show and figure out, do I or do I fucking not know what I'm talking about, right? Am I not as passionate about Bitcoin? Well, I've done 120 episodes of this show two hours, you know, talking about it. You ask me, do I, am I technically incompetent? Is there some reason like that? I built Celine Well, bro, like, <laughs> it's, it's not that I can't figure that out. Do I not know the history? I was fucking there for all of it. Um, you know, it's just like whatever excuse you have to yourself, is it because I'm trying to meddle with you and screw up BTC? Well, partially, yes, obviously, I think you should switch to BCH and so forth, but I'm transparent about that. I'm not trying to lie. I'm not trying to hide it. And also, I'm too busy these days to really get in the weeds and disrupt all of you. I don't need to. The narrative's on unraveling on its own. You know, I'm busy shipping updates for Celine Wallet. So, you know, take take it or leave it, but it's all it's all right there. All right, we got one, we got part four and then uh, something else, which is also sort of like a part five. Okay, here we go. So now we get to uh, where, where, where is the part of the problem that the gaslighting is happening? These guys are all confused. What's happening? What's, you know, uh, what's the problem? Is, who, who is the one who is injecting the poison into the patient? You know, who's the one who actually knows? Who's the character that's like the salty ex-boyfriend or whatever that was like secretly poisoning the tea with the arsenic that triggered this whole thing? Well, it's the propaganda wing of the party, isn't it? And who's that? Peter McCormack, what Bitcoin did. So let's have a listen to what he had to say on his uh, recent episode. I'm spitballing an idea when I'm completely out of my depth. And that's okay. <laughs> can, can, can we wrap a little blockchain into a UTXO? <laughs> yeah, and that's where you start getting into what I think is sort of like the zero knowledge proof ish stuff. Yeah. Um, where it's like, okay, we'll like keep the blockchain over here and we can prove that the blockchain did XYZ thing and we'll just put the proofs back in Bitcoin core, like back in the Bitcoin blockchain. Um but all the data will live somewhere else. You start running to this problem of like, where's the data for it? Who needs yeah. to know about the data? Who has access to the data to verify that what happened in that chain is exactly correct as you would expect? Yeah. I, I mean, it's a, I feel like this is like scaling is a hard problem. Yeah. It's like a very hard problem. And it's because of this like um, consensus. Like we, you come back to consensus, like who needs to be in consensus? Who gets to participate in consensus? If you can't participate in consensus like that, like, are you really a self-sovereign member of the, of that particular ecosystem? Like, yeah. Cause I, I keep coming back to the idea. You, you, you either had to have gone the Roger Veer route, which is keep growing the, the blockchain, sacrifice decentralization uh, and more people can have UTXOs. Mm. We agreed that's a terrible idea. Yeah, I think and, so. And, uh, so the better idea is to maintain decentralization mm. and UTXOs are a privilege the, until somebody solves something in between. I think that's where we're at. And it's like yeah. it's shit for people to hear because essentially it's a two tier system. You know, we have the yes. we have the peasants and the elites <laughs> because the elites get the UTXOs and the peasants. Don't. I'm, I'm being facetious. But. Yeah, I mean, it does sort of look that shape, doesn't it? 
So I don't even really know who this girl is. Apparently, I just had a look. It's Nifty Nay on Twitter, but she's uh, involved with Base Fifty Eight, BTC, BTC Plus Plus runs Core Lightning, and I think I saw somebody mentioning that she has something to do with uh, Blockstream, right? But she's just, and I, I again, I don't think she even necessarily has these like evil intentions, but she's just been brought up and uh what's the what's the word marinated in this culture of lies from the blockstream and bitcoin core and all the technical developers and so forth there that is she is now spreading out as this sort of perceived authority figure right which is that she says oh it's all comes back to consensus what was the whole fucking point of the block size war it was this gaslighting about you need to have consensus you don't have consensus and consensus could never be defined and in fact it could never even be discussed because if you brought it up you were banned from our bitcoin and you weren't allowed to talk at the conferences and then if you uh were the one saying well what about if we make a change to consensus well now you're a shit coiner alt coiner bitcoin xt shill big <laughs> blocker you know get out of here and you're banned, right? So anything will be considered, anything will be considered except for the actual root of the problem. There's just this endless gaslighting to preserve like a fog of confusion around it. I've got this meme here of the kombucha girl that I made. You know, there's one where the girl has like the face like ooh, and then the face like mm, I'd consider that. And uh, the ooh face is raising the block size. And the I'd consider that face is everything else. Lightning Network, Liquid Arc, Fetty Mint, Coin Pools, Drive Chains, Recursive Ordinals, Bitcoin VM, Custodians, Litecoin, Fiat Currency, right? Aging like fine wine like all my other memes and uh she <laughs> she is just explaining this exact same thing now it's these uh zk proofs this uh, zero knowledge whatever which has been backported from uh the ethereum community who that's what the solution they're looking at. it's not the right solution with bitcoin we have the utxo model just fucking raise the block size you know but that cannot be considered that has to be heresy but people are asking questions. And so what does is, what is, uh, Peter McCormack say? It's that same thing, Roger Ver, bad man. It's the exact same as Donald Trump, orange man, bad. Roger Ver, big block, man, bad. It's literally the identical. Wait, wait, wait. I can't make it more clear to you. <laughs> That's what it is. It's Trump, orange man, bad, stay asleep. It's the same thing. And I know the guys from the BDC community, a lot of them are pro, you know, re Republican and sort of anti-Democrat, right? Trump, orange man, bad. Roger Veer, big block, billionaire man, bad. How you cannot see that it's the same playbook is beyond me, but it is. And just in this case, you're the one being, being fooled. And there's a huge false dilemma there. If we raise the block size, we sacrifice decentralization and it's presented as this absolute unquestionable truth, which it is not. If the block size went from one megabyte to 1.1 megabyte, would BTC be instantly centralized and over? No, of course not. It's a spectrum. Decentralization is not you're decentralized or you're not. It's like you're very decentralized if you have a million nodes and uh, you know a broad community and a diverse range of hash rate and you know adoption and political defense from grassroots activism and well-funded companies, you know, supporting the scene and all these different metrics. But let's just break it down to nodes. You're very decentralized if you have a million nodes and you're not very de you're very centralized if you have one or two or five, but at a hundred or a thousand or 10,000, well, it's a spectrum and it's the exact same thing. The block size is just trading off on a spectrum against those other uh, interests that you need to have, like low transaction fees and throughput and so forth, right? So, or the need to store other data on the on the chain, a la, you know, inscriptions, although that's another giant <laughs> scam, basically. But the whole point is that the uh, it's a spectrum, not an absolute binary, but it's presented as a false dilemma. And it's, it's so ridiculous because there's, of course, more gaslighting and lies and hoaxes to cover this all up. Because like we saw with that Pete Rizzo episode where he says, well, basically, in the end, we did a block size increase. And then Peter says to him, no, that was a block weight increase. It wasn't a, you know, SegWit wasn't technically a block size increase. And it wasn't back in the day, but now it's been rebranded. And apparently that was OK. And then Peter Todd on stage at Bitcoin Honey Badger is saying like, well, 40 megabytes 
you know, would actually be fine, but we've got four so that we've got a 10x headroom. Like he's saying it right out there that you, it's, it wouldn't be sacrificing decentralization at all, but it's whatever is the convenient narrative for the moment that will just be, you know, brought up to just continue this cycle of confusion and delusion. And if you think, and again, Peter McCormick, he's probably, you know, not some bad guy. I don't think this is maliciously out there. He's just a very convenient, well-placed rube. And you can see this because of the way that he, his opinion changes like the wind. If anybody who follows any of his content will know with the ordinal stuff, he has somebody on who says ordinals are great. And then he says, yeah, I think ordinals are pretty cool. You know, let's just leave them. They're not doing any harm. And then he has somebody come on, you know, Bitcoin mechanic who says it's a scam and it's really bad. And he says, yeah, no, we should be conservative about the block size. We should just, uh, you know, ban these things or at least change them or figure out some solutions. And then he has Casey Rodimer and he says, oh, actually this guy was pretty cool. Uh, you know, I think ordinals are kind of fine now. And he just ping pongs back and forth to it. And his excuse every time is, well, you know, people learn and they change their mind, which is true. People always can change their mind. But if you're changing your mind, at, you know, based on the last person you talk to every five minutes, that's not, you know, updating your opinion based on new information. That's just being a rube that is led along by whatever the latest narrative is. And that's exactly what he's being fed by this girl here, you know, uh, Roger Veer, man, bad, block size increase, destroys decentralization, it's all over. Because you can't have any thought crime or any questions about, well, why don't we just raise the block size? Because like Vitalik asking the wizards in the intro to this show, as soon as you start going down that line of, you know, start pulling on that thread, that starts to get you to the root of the disease because you have to go back and reevaluate the history and what are the Bitcoin cashers doing and what were they saying then and what are they saying now and what are we doing wrong and why is it not working and, you know, on and on and on and on and on. I think this, I don't know, this case is just becoming unstoppable. If, it, if these guys can listen to this 30 minutes and not have at least a twinge of like, what the fuck are we doing? I will be amazed. Uh, any thoughts on that, Peter McCormack? I mean, it doesn't surprise me at all. Like, I, I think I've kind of, like, before the show, I never paid attention to Peter. Like, we started bringing him up in uh, a couple clips and whatnot. So I've maybe watched two episodes of his podcast. I, <clears throat> I think I'm still in their Telegram group. But I think at this point, I've, like, written him off as just a grifter. Like, I don't, as soon as the next shiny thing comes along that will make him money, he's on that. Like, I don't... And so all of the social, like, um, oh, what is it? Like virtue signaling, I guess, or like pandering is just positioning himself to make sure he still has a job in the future, which is disappointing. I mean, I get why, but come on. Well, I mean, it's like they say, it's very hard to tell a man, you know, um, whatever it is, it's very hard to, com to convince a man he's wrong about what his salary depends on or whatever that saying is, right? It's like it's it's paying his bills shilling all this bpc nonsense and just going in circles and he's traveling around the world meeting cool people with his mates having a good life of course he's not going to listen to anything that doesn't just become the thing in vogue that he has to address uh, and and he won't and his sponsors don't want to hear it the power brokers at blockstream and bitcoin core don't want to hear it and he could easily just leverage the same accusation against me and just say, well, you're doing, you're running flip side for the BCH podcast. Why are you any different? You're just shilling BCH because that's your thing, you know. But the difference is that, uh, you know, I arrived at my conclusion with facts and evidence as outlined, you know, laboriously, uh, whereas you just go wherever the money is, you know. So Bitcoin appear to be electronic cash system. It's in the white paper, like... God. Okay. All right. So let's have a look now. We've just closing it up with just the God, like, like the, yeah, that was perfect. That's a fantastic little cherry on top. All right. We got one more little thing here. We got to look at then here, which is the, the bankless, uh, guys. So you might say to me, okay, Jeremy, there's this huge regime. BTC is all a scam and they're busy trying to uh, shut out and suppress information about BCH and we can't accept all these scams and lies and stuff like that. We're not the only people in the world. Why isn't BCH getting traction elsewhere? And that's a very good question. So let's have a look at how BCH is being covered 
outside of the sort of BDC maxi laser eye bubbles. And we've got the bankless guys, the Ethereum uh, top shillers talking to Robin Linus, who is the creator of BitVM. And in this uh, grand topic, they had a little hit on BCH. So let's hear that. So asking others or like without finding consensus among the entire community. It's a good explanation, good way to like kind of delineate the camps. There's those, those that believe that Bitcoin should just be an asset or, you know, like that's that's kind of, you know, what they're most interested in. Those that believe it should be an asset and a currency. I think you fall into that camp. There was another camp that felt that way too back in 2017 and they forked off and they did the Bitcoin cash type thing. It was a departure in terms of, of how they thought about Bitcoin, the asset, but also their their philosophy for how to actually scale this. And I'm guessing you're not sort of in the big block philosophy because you've stayed with Bitcoin and you're trying to scale the network as is with these four megabyte by, uh, blocks and you know do do it via zk proofs. But uh, talk about that. Why like why didn't you go fork off and, and join the uh, the Bitcoin Cash crew who is also talking about like Bitcoin should be a, a, you know currency. Uh, a means of payment and not just an asset. Why have you stayed with Bitcoin uh, up until this point in time? Well, I think there's only one Bitcoin and um, I'm not that set on uh, the block size as it is right now. Um, I would be open to discuss block size increases. Um, I totally see the, the counter arguments. Uh, I, I totally think that um, most people should be able to run full nodes and uh, sync within a reasonable amount of time. And I think that is a very fundamental property of Bitcoin and uh, we should not relax that, we should not harm that. Um, but on the other hand, computers are improving a lot. Um, internet connectivity is improving drastically. And um, over time, we can definitely increase the block size safely, I think. Um, if we can do it right now, or if we should do it in a couple of years, that's open for debate. But in general, I, I, don't, think, I don't think it's like a bad idea in general. I think uh, it is definitely worth talking about that. And even back then, people like Adam Beck said that it makes sense to like double the block size in I don't know, five year intervals or something like that. And um, I don't like, I think there is kind of like a trauma, trauma in the Bitcoin community because <laughs> of that block size wars, yeah. uh, that it became like kind of a stigma to even talk about it and to, to mention it at all. And um, I, I kind of understand where, where, where this is coming from, but I feel like the new generation of Bitcoin developers, like me or like the, the people that I hang out with, um, they are way more open to, to these ideas. And uh, I think it would be fine to, to increase the block size over time. I'd like to hop back into the uh, BitVM uh, conversation. Uh, you, you, when you were explaining it in your background and, and the progress yeah. that you've made so far, you, there was a, a Eureka moment. So they, there you have it. And so what's happening outside the BTC controlled conversation. Well, firstly, acknowledgement at, wait a second, why are we here back at these same narratives? BCH needs to be a medium of exchange. What about doing additional assets on BCH, like on Bitcoin? Like the BCH community has just been front running because we've been in the real world, exactly what the BTC community is just slowly catching up to. And it's taking them fucking forever, but they're slowly getting there and just drips and drabs. And this guy, is here and he can acknowledge when he's on a different in a different sphere of things there's a taboo and all that. i mean we've heard about that on what bitcoin did and so forth right but he can at least speak a bit more frankly about it but even he just still is propagating these same like lies and mistruths about like adam back saying well we could raise the block size in five years which he probably did but that was seven years ago and where's adam back coming out okay guys the five years has come up let's do a block size increase no he's not doing that that was all just gaslighting just like these democratic political operatives the exact same thing to just pick some point in the distant future where there's not really going to be accountability and just stall everything down to a grinding halt, sand in the gears, just like Stefan Molyneux talked about in 2014. And, and then just by the time that comes around, you just spin a new narrative and just kick the can down the road further and further and further and just 
delay everything with this endless bureaucracy like you were talking about, right? So this even this guy can't get to the bottom of what's actually going on or how to make any forward progress. And the bankless host can't either. They, you saw when he said uh, there's only one Bitcoin, you saw David on, he just nods. He's like, yeah, yeah, no, that's true. He's bought into the, all that. These guys have never had, as far as I can tell, I might be wrong. They've done hundreds of episodes, but as far as I can tell, they've never had somebody on to argue for BCH. They've had all kinds of people talk about and bring up BCH and talk about the blocks as war and all of that. But I don't think they've ever had anybody genuinely come on the show who was a sort of BCH maximalist like myself or like Emergent Reasons or somebody like that who could make the case for BCH from the history, all all correct and and hear what they have to say. You know, I have uh, poked poked them on Twitter a little bit. You know, I've wrecked David in a couple of threads to try and get his attention and be the same thing I did with Eric Wall and be like, listen, I've got something important to say here. You know, let me just kick your ass on something that you think you're an expert in so that you realize maybe this is, some, you know, somebody I should look into a little bit more. But he just he he just gets saltier and he just brushes it off and he doesn't want to look into it at all so even though these guys on any other topic would say well let's hear both sides obviously this is uniquely the one thing that they will not have a bch related guest on they're welcome to prove me wrong i would love that if they got somebody to actually talk it through but they just still have their narrative of the big blockers of the shit coiners who had these stupid ideas and whatever and they can't just self-reflect and think why is it that we just keep coming back to BCH and this 2017 and the block size wars over and over and over again? It's 2024. Why haven't things moved on? Why is this same point in Bitcoin history perennially relevant and something we're always asking our guests about? And why would we not hear the other fucking side of the story just once? Not once. So just calling you out there. Ryan actually seems like a pretty cool guy, but David, gen genuinely, I'm a bit like... Mate, what is, what is going wrong with you? He just has this arrogant, you know, dismissal of the BCH community. And any time I'm talking to him about it, he he's exactly like a laser eye, even though he should be able to be somewhat objective. He swallowed all the Kool-Aid because he just came into crypto in 2017 or whatever. Once the censorship was already in full force and he's never, ever gone back and done the work to at least hear the other side of the story. He wouldn't have to agree with it, obviously. But to actually understand where the BCH community is coming from, like, how could you ever get the truth about anything? Like, how could you ever get the truth about Russia if you never asked any Russian about it ever? You only asked Americans and, you know, Europeans and Africans. Like, why wouldn't you just once ask a fucking Russian what is going on in Russia or what their history of their country is or what's going on, you know? And like... It's just unbelievable to me that these guys, that these journalists. So this just, just goes to show that this is the problem is most acute in the BBC community. But BCH suffers this from every side. The propaganda and censorship was so widespread and so convincing and so impactful on everyone that even people who should be neutral are still essentially not even neutral. They're still fighting against, you know. BCH and finding ways to dismiss and suppress it. And you just get these tiny little threads of, of BCH in their stuff and never like, let's actually find someone who knows what they're talking about and get to the real root of the problem. So they become by extension, part of the sort of gaslighting and propaganda and everything from the, from the ground up. What's your take on this? Uh, so is David the top right guy? Okay. Yeah, then David's Ryan. on the right. Ryan's on the left. Okay, and who's on the bottom here? The bottom is the guest, Robin Linus, the BBM guy. Oh, okay. Okay. So my my question was going to be, do you think like him saying that he would be willing to talk about a block size increase kind of mark the point where they might start talking about Bitcoin Cash? But if it's just a guess, I doubt that'll be the that'll be the case. Well, um, interesting. I I did notice I was watching the top left guys like reactions as uh, the fellow on the bottom was speaking, and it seemed like as soon as he mentioned that there was trauma, and that he was willing to talk about it, or like that he'd be open to it, there was some 
there's some squintiness like there's a like without even saying a word you could see the skepticism and like kind of the like just below the surface triggering kind of happening uh and i don't i've never watched any like full podcast by these guys but i wonder is it that trauma coming out that like is causing the squinty skepticism dismissal or is it some other but that's it that's the thing like and i i mean these guys have done great work don't get me wrong i've listened to quite a lot of bankless and they're really important voice in the crypto scene and something like that but they truly justify being called out on this because like you say they've just had so many guests who've all talked shit about bch or dismissed it or like this guy here and they're btc holders and i guess they either came in post the fork or they immediately dumped or whatever they've never heard the other side of the story don't really remember them talking about hijacking Bitcoin, but maybe that was on an episode I didn't catch. They've got a lot of a lot of stuff. Uh, but I feel like it would have come up on my radar probably if they'd been talking about hijacking Bitcoin seriously. And just, yeah, they just have bought the Kool-Aid by extension. They're smart enough to know all the problems in BTC because they can see it from an ETH perspective. Okay, the fees aren't working and the blah, blah, blah. But even though they're objectively removed in that sense, they still come up with the same like garbage when it comes to to bch just finding ways to dismiss it and btc is the one true bitcoin and you know the big blockers were idiots that were wrong and they just went off on their own and they're irrelevant and i mean to his credit ryan does ask you know why why don't you go join up with them like but yeah they've just had segments on the show before as well too uh, I think uh, they had one with Nick Carter a while ago. I too think we we did a segment about it on this show where uh, Ryan and I mean uh, Nick and David were talking about oh and the big blockers and they thought this and they thought that and it was like why wouldn't you just fucking ask one what they thought? Why do you have this whole narrative of how everything went from the big block side when you've never even I don't know I I can't handle any more of this. <laughs> Let's. David, you're an asshole. I've called you out enough times. Fucking listen to what I have to say. Listen to this whole 40 minutes and tell me I'm wrong after that. Okay, next one. And to kind of wrap it up, put a bow on it all. We've got meme of the week. <laughs> this poor sap in El Salvador where Bitcoin is not working and where BTC City, which was promised three years ago, is not being delivered. There's some... Um, text that pops up during this uh video so for the audio listeners actually jet can you narrate this one i've been doing a lot of talking just read out the sort of titles that come up uh, as the clip plays yeah bitcoin city my bad well it's gonna be right there in the Fonseca gulf and it's gonna include everything residential areas commercial areas services museums entertainment crypto enthusiast Corbin Keegan heard El Salvador was planning to build a Bitcoin city. He packed up his life in Chicago and headed for Conchagua, uh, the site of the planned development. More than two years later, he's still waiting for the first brick to be laid. So I'm the first resident of this Bitcoin city uh, in, in Conchagua here that we are. Uh, I think I'm, I'm the only white immigrant or, uh, you know, a new Salvadorian or, or Bitcoin city resident. 2021, El Salvador became the first country to adopt Bitcoin as legal tender. Resident Nayib Bukele built Bitcoin city as a futuristic metropolis. Bitcoin mining would be powered by geothermal energy of a nearby volcano. And residents would pay no income tax. I told people one day a nation state will adopt Bitcoin and they thought I was crazy. And then here, here it was. I never even heard of El Salvador, but I, I learned about the, the new Bitcoin president and his uh, plans to, to, um, to not only adopt Bitcoin, but um, develop a Bitcoin city. El Salvador's crypto experiment has been widely seen as a failure. Okay. Oh. There 
is little sign Bitcoin City will be built anytime soon. That's it. So this is just meme of the week. The Lightning Network will be ready in 18 months and Bitcoin City will be ready in just two more years. And this poor sap here who's just been gaslit with all the lies about BTC and about Naib Bukele and he was going to make this grand futuristic city and all that. It was just to create hype for the BTC community and pump the price. And he has been lied to and he's wasted two years of his life sitting on this beach wondering when is it going to happen? And he finally woke up that it wasn't and he'd been gaslit and lied to. And that's just the perfect encapsulation of everything that I've just talked about in a slightly more humorous way, right? And slightly less painful. Like it's two years hey, it's a beach holiday <laughs> yeah yeah and it's only been two well yeah two years on a beach holiday we've been doing seven years of guys what the fuck is going on here yeah yeah i feel like there's not that much more to say so let's just get on message to the community okay so for the bch community I think a lot of you guys already know this and you've already seen this. You've already followed it all on this show. This is not this is not news to any of you, but I'm hoping that this adds some more context and clarity to it. And of course, you can go look into the US election stuff if you're not familiar with that, because these same patterns just repeat and repeat in human nature in all kinds of scales and sizes and different arenas. It's the same thing, propaganda and gaslighting. So just we need to be aware of that because we can't let that creep into the BCH community. And we've been doing a good job of not doing that. So that's um, that that part sorted. For everyone else, I'm going to tag all those people who we've called out and wrecked in this show. I already said it in that section where I listed off like my credibility to be making these claims. The logic stands on its own and there is no way to dismiss me as just some ignorant hater who doesn't know what they're talking about. So watch it very seriously, then look in the mirror and think, how long am I going to keep lying to myself? It's really that simple. Do it or don't, you know, the consequences will be on you, not me. But uh, if you want to come talk about it, I'm open to it for, from any of you. Okay, cool. Well, let's do supporter appreciation. Unless, do you have a message to the community, Jet? Any chance? Be safe. Cool. Be safe. Yeah, good one. All right. Supporter appreciation. Thank you to our donators. Uh, thank you to our patrons, Ricky and HP. Thank you to our sponsors, General Protocols. Check out bchbull.com. Uh, the flip starter is running, like I said, at BCH Podcast, flipstarter.cash. Uh, contributors already Majumalu, Marcelo, Molecular, Odegan Talk, Emergent Reasons, Peter McCormack, lol, not Adam back this time. Good one, whoever's uh, putting in those troll names. Brian Kanachi, and you potentially, you can get on that list and get shouted out if you go to BCH Podcast, flipstarter.cash, and send in at least half a BCH. Uh, thank you all for watching. Start guide FAQs links at www.bitcoincashpodcast.com. If you're new, listen to episode 85 and get the foundations of what all this is about. Try Celine Wallet at Celine.cash. Jet, do you have a shout out? I do. So I went to like a birthday party, I guess. A uh, couple. La hmm. Time's screwy. I don't know if it was last weekend or maybe the weekend before. Um, and I ended up speaking to a guy named Noah. Uh, who was just <clears throat> kind of watching cryptocurrency in his periphery. Uh, and I think we were just talking about things for like I don't know, four hours. So know if you end up watching this, since I did send him uh, along to the podcast and I was like, watch episode 85 first. If, you, if you've made it through from 85 to now, uh, glad to have you on board, brother. Yeah, mine's similar. Uh, my shout out is to Damien and Hamish, who I was talking to the other day, my relatives, about uh, all of this. And I told them about the podcast. I showed them Celine Wallet and uh, told them to listen to episode 85. And they were like, damn, two and a half hours, three hours, that's a lot. And I was like, well, if there was any shorter way to say it, I would have said it shorter, but <laughs> there wasn't. So, I mean, we will also try and make some shorter you know, more introductory materials, but there's only so much time in the day. We haven't got around to it yet. And there's a lot of important information. It's a big idea, Bitcoin Cash. So you kind of need to hear at least those fundamentals. And then if you've got that, the rest of the show should make sense. 
Okay, I think that'll do it. Thank you everyone for listening. Hope you've enjoyed this rant heavy episode of the Bitcoin Cash podcast and till next time. What you're seeing now is my normal state. This is a Super Saiyan. And this is what is known as a Super Saiyan that has ascended past a Super Saiyan. Or you could just call this a Super Saiyan 2. What a useless transformation. You've changed your hair, so what? Just wait. Has he really found a way to surpass an ascended Saiyan? Is that possible?